All right, a very good morning to you. Welcome along to OTBAM this Wednesday morning, the 9th of October. It's uh, 7.31. As ever, if you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet the show at Off The Ball AM. It's our Twitter handle, or you can leave a comment on whatever stream you're watching us. Our guest this morning is Nod Breslin. Good morning to you. How are you doing? Morning. How are you? Uh, bushy tails. You're, uh, you're, uh, you love the early mornings? It's a tough gig, all right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing open around here at 7 in the morning. No, so you've got a queue out outside. I literally queued outside a coffee shop at 7 o'clock looking like a lost puppy. And yeah. Me and then. So I'm good. Uh, people know you obviously as a, um, the frontman of the Blizzards, but you know obviously a rugby career as well. But a GAA career too. I just discovered this morning, nearly. Well, yeah. I mean, I think everybody where I'm from had a GAA career at some stage. But um, I, used to, I, I never saw myself as a rugby player. I was a, I was a GAA player. Right. I kind of turned into a rugby player. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, my whole background was 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 GAA. I went to GAA school, St Mary's Mullingar. Uh, playing rugby when you went to that school wasn't particularly uh, uh, wasn't particularly uh, encouraged. promoted or encouraged at all. The Christian brothers weren't keen on it. And I remember going to the Under 19 World Cup. Uh, it was in, it was just the year of my leaving cert in uh, Wales, and like I thought, oh, the school would get behind this. Like they were like, they literally were <laughs> really yeah you know, having none of it. That's and then, terrible, isn't it? And the, the day I think the day I was leaving for the Under 19 World Cup, and like you're kind of watching yourself and you don't want to get injured. I had to play some crappy challenge game for the school against some other, like, just just made me play it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there was that kind of, in the same way, I suppose, rugby schools in Dublin, would, would you wouldn't be the rushing reverse. to play Gaelic football yeah. there. It was the same thing. But, yeah, I'm a, I was a Gaelic footballer turned rugby player. A bit mad, though, that you wouldn't get behind somebody on an Ireland team going to World Cup. I think some of them would, but then there was the kind of there was the couple of couple of the coaches that were just like not having any of it. But like to me, I didn't really care. But then we were like Declan Kidney was our coach, so I, I was kind of talk, talking to him about it, going like it's really hard not getting you know supported. But like then my club, which was Mullingar Shamrocks, they were all about it. Yeah, of they course. Were like, just once you send, give us your jerseys at the end of it and all, and we can raffle them off. So it was this kind of it was weird because still to this day, um, I still preferred Gaelic. I found Gaelic a very simple. I played professional rugby for three years, and I still didn't know the rules. <laughs> it was like what these books of rules. I was like, my God, rugby Gaelic is so simple, uh, and when played properly, it's it's an incredible sport. But at the time, Westmead were we just won the All Ireland minor. We were there was a buzz in the county. And were you close to that team? Uh, no, I, be, I was about fourteen or fifteen. Um, I was the goalkeeper at that time for the school, which had literally most of the minor team on it. Right. Uh, and I was in goals, and then the kind of readers, I kind of shot up at about 14, 15 years of age to so six right. foot four in midfield, midfield yeah. full forward, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, no, I did that. We had, there was a buzz on Westmead at the time, and then a few years later, obviously, under 21, so we had, a, we had a really good buzz underage, but we couldn't quite get it. Sometimes we got, obviously, when Potty came to the senior level, but yeah, it wasn't quite the transition, a different, a different story altogether. Yeah, yeah, okay, we might come back to some of that a little bit later on. Um, USA have just scored a try deep into stoppage time to make it 47-17, so that's, sorry, 47-17 to Argentina, so obviously they're, they're going to lose the game, but it's a consolation last gasp try for USA, and I think their last, their last game. The, the fans are time. celebrating anyway, that <coughs> the USA fans are doing what they do best. If you've travelled all the way to Japan from the USA, then I suspect that um, you're entitled to... to, to uh, um, so to celebrate that one, how has your World Cup been so far? What do you think of where we're going and, and where we are? What, what's your level of concern ahead of the last, potentially I mean, our last game? The concern is everybody else. I'm just reading here, like the, the, the one thing that really stands out to me that is missing, um, and it, the thing I would say about it being missing, I don't think we can't get it back, and that's the good thing, is that absolute manic intensity that we played with when we played the All Blacks. We played these teams, but we played it with control. And we seem to be playing with some control, all right, but that control is almost too controlled, and it's 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 a bit static. Um, and Ireland are a phase team; they're a phase play team. And in a World Cup, in that heat and that humidity, because I put a tweet up after the Japan games, and I'd actually wonder is the humidity a part to play here? And people are abusing me, going, "It's got nothing to do with it." Any sports scientist will tell you it, it absolutely does have something to do with even your cognitive ability to think. Um, but when you're playing phase play, it's an incredibly energy sapping thing for forwards to play, uh, where you're just taking and you're hoping to make one metre to keep the honest defence. Um, and we were playing that, and we weren't, we weren't, it wasn't working for us. Uh, and in doing that as well, we were getting absolutely consumed from an energy point of view. So to the point, the intensity is missing. Um, we had a bit of it against Scotland, and we had that slight manicness, kind of just fast gain line. And, we, we haven't against Japan, and I do, I do think people would say, like, the poorer teams, you need to be able to play, uh, like, the All Blacks will just put Namibia to bed. You need to be able to do that. But that's not really that's our culture, a slightly though. binary approach to rugby. Rugby yeah. is an incredibly complex sport, um, and yes, maybe they should be doing that, but in my head, if we get to South Africa, uh, I have a feeling, or whoever, that, that manic intensity will come back. 
um, I think there's a way of picking up for that, uh, and that's me being slightly optimistic. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of concerns you talk to people at the minute, and they're like, oh, what if we do play New Zealand in the quarterfinals? Um, you know, we could play our best game of the tournament and still get hockey at the gate because this New Zealand team are, are pretty special. Um, the, uh, the, the old, the old cliche in sport is that um, it's it's easier to have the ball than not have the ball, and so if, if you're if you're playing this energy sapping style, well, at least the opposition are having to defend it. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's really easy to defend against that because there's no brain power involved. It's like that guy's going to get the ball, he's going to. And that guy's going to get the ball. He's going to. So we just push up and push them back and push them I back. Mean, I play back row <coughs> and all day, every day. You take that. Uh, you know, if you're playing with some level of intensity, let's say like Japan played played with, that's the type of phase play that you can handle. Uh, especially when the issue being is that we weren't uh, we weren't attacking the game line really. We weren't flat enough in terms of like John, Johnny was like our what do you call it? Um, Carty. Carty was. Um, the way he was playing, it was working for a period of time. I keep going back to the Japan game, but I have to break it down. I actually never enjoyed and hated a game more in my life because I was watching Japan going, that's the rugby I love, that intensity, that just, there was no fear, zero fear. Uh, and to me, there has to be a level of that sport. And to say elite sport like rugby, especially rugby, there is this, we're looking at the, the USA here, and I mean, I know a lot of lads who play in the USA, who they kind of see rugby as that game of like, to, like failed wrestlers might play, or, or you know people who play at NFL. Rugby is an immensely skillful sport. It's so complex, and there's so many layers that have to work from first phase to your your you know your scrums, your lineout, every element of it, and it hasn't been clicking for us. And the thing about it is, anyone who turns to me and tells me Japan's a better team than Ireland, you're, you're, you know you're you're not, you're talking absolute crap. It's, they're not. Uh, they played better on the day. If Ireland click. But the, the one thing that will make that click is we have to figure a way letting go of that fear. Um, and knowing some of the players, they do get utterly consumed by that uh, before the game. And it now looks like during the game. And it's normal for elite athletes to feel that you're before a game, but once you get on that pitch, that has to be gone. Yeah. And it seems to be where some of us are, are holding on to that. How, how fixable is that in the middle of a tournament, though? Um, I personally, I think. I mean, I'm obviously, I'm, I, I think, in my perspective, if we do get a quarterfinal and we're South Africa, New Zealand, you're going to see an utterly different mindset, and it will be that level of like, let's just go for this. Let's just, and there has been that slight tiptoe stuff with like Russia. Um, absolutely no offense, you know, you 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 better off playing an AIL team um, really at that point. Um, and it's very hard to play with that intensity against teams that simply. They, they don't, that they're not on the same level as yeah. you. And I know that argument is what you should be. It's just not that simple. Yeah, um, but we've never beaten teams who are inferior to us easily. No. Like, even against uh, bad Scotland teams or bad Italy teams, frequently we let them into the game, or frequently we would only get the bonus point in the last 10 minutes because it would just be, that's not our, it's not our culture to be the, the bully boys. Because um, we were the bully boys. We were, we were the ones getting that bait. And, I, remember, I remember we used to celebrate back in the uh, 90s when we didn't get the wooden spoon. We used, I remember my dad used to go, yes. And I, I, met, uh, I met Joe uh, a couple of uh, months ago, did a, a talk with him from one of our rugby club. And I said to Joe, you've given Irish people something that we really shouldn't get, a sense of entitlement when it comes to sport. We expect to yeah. be absolutely <clears throat> top of a game. Um, and we are. We're, we are one of the best teams in the world. We're the best, best, best players in the world. Um, and one thing I would say is, is people always talk about that, but where that came from, when I was kind of playing, the academies were being set up. And I don't think the IRFU get enough credit for what they did, because that was incredibly, that they looked way, way beyond what, what they were, what they kind of, let, let's give players five grand to keep them in the country. That was the academy contracts. Um, this was a long-term strategy. And if you look at the players that Ireland have and the squad we have, if we can get it to click and get that mm, that wild intensity back that we had against the, the other teams, and that is form. But one of the things that I have noticed is that that on-field fear that we seem to it seems to be like, what do we do? Um, and that is something I'm a bit concerned about. Yeah, they're, they're thinking about stuff which should be second nature, which should have been at this stage conditioned. You know, the the joy of having a very confined structure that Ireland have is supposed to be that it becomes second nature and so you automatically just fill in whatever gaps are there and you understand exactly what the game plan is the game plan we everybody knows exactly what it is now it appears as if they're kind of thinking about what the game plan is and the knock-on happens or the kick doesn't go to touch and it's like oh I, I was I wasn't in the zone and I, I, to be fair at least sport you don't have that option you cannot think like that you cannot think what happened what's about to happen you've got to be right in the moment everything you're doing that's how sport is it is but one of the other things I look at with with the Ireland squad is that they have this 
like if you look say it's a, a tactical point of view when I'm being most impressed with them in, in the World Cup is, is when they're running off shoulders that is the one thing I'm concerned about they're not they're not doing the, the, the running off shoulders the offloading game it's not really their game and um, I do believe when Dan Levy was playing he was he was that incredible link for that type of play yeah. he really suited as a seven and, a, and if you're an open side flanker that really is one of your pri primary jobs whereas sevens now have seemed to be their primary jobs to slow down play for me the, the kind of classical seven role was to be off the shoulder of every runner and every, but now because all our phase runners, you can't offload in those tight phase in environments. But then I think it was again at Russia. There was one stage where Lamar, uh, Jordan Lamar went went out, out out wide and came off his shoulder, and it was just so simple. It was two phases off the shoulder. You have someone that's that quick, one of the quickest players in the World Cup, who will always attack the outside shoulder, and on that outside shoulder there is always uh, an offload. Um, and we just don't seem to want to play in that that game, and that is definitely a tactical decision to to play to play tight and, and maybe not offload. Yeah. So um, and if you look at some of the other, let's watch in Argentina there, their first instincts to offload, but, but that's their second nature. Yeah, yeah. I, what what about the? So we're talking ifs and maybes, and what's your confidence level that we will? So let's assume for a moment, which is a mistake straight off the bat, that we do get through the weekend. Um, and you know we're in some we're in a quarterfinal against somebody uh, either the All Blacks or, or South Africa. What's your confidence level that we get the performance that we're capable of, irrespective of the victory or irrespective of the outcome? That actually at least at the end of that game they'll go, well we gave it our all and it was either good enough or it wasn't. Um, honestly, I think with Samoa, I think Ireland will not underestimate Samoa. Maybe the day, the thing about Samoa is a lot of those Irish um, guys would have played Samoa underage. Uh, no matter how maybe inferior they are from skill point of view, they're one of the most horrifically hard-hitting physical teams that you ever come up against. You could get the, you could get the type of hit where you can't breathe for ten minutes after the moment. That's their thing. So I think from a kind of intensity point of view, Ireland will not underestimate them. Um, they should win that game and they should win it well. But if they don't bring that kind of intensity that we keep talking about they're going to find it very, very difficult. And if they try to play that tight phase play against the Simones, they're going to end up in, in intensive care. Yeah. It is not a type of thing you play against them. So they're going to have to alter it in some way. In terms of the next, whatever that is, the All Blacks or, or South Africa, I honestly believe, truthfully believe, I have enough trust in the players that, that those players, um, that there's going to be, a, there's, something's going to happen there. There's going to be a pick. There's going to be a... <coughs> there, they know this, um, and one of the big things with elite sport, whether it's Gaelic football or, or, or um, rugby, is distraction. Uh, I keep going back to it. And the one thing that you get most distracted by is media. Um, and you know, this, that that's just a fact. If they say they don't, that they're lying. You know, you do. You get caught up by it a little bit, and you can start reading into media, and you can start reading media who don't have quite the context that the squad would have in terms of what they're, how they're trying to play and what they're trying to build and you can buy into it, and that can be really distracting for individual players. So what I would be doing if I was um, the squad, I'm sure Joe is doing, is, is trying to keep them a little more insular and, and concentrating on getting that level of let's absolutely rip into these guys when we get them. Let's maybe take the hat off and maybe that fear factor, because if, if we don't, we'll be beaten and we'll probably be beaten badly. Yeah, all right. Uh, it's 7.44. Let's go to Japan, because our man in Japan is Owen Shane. Owen, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. What's the crack? Where are you? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm in Oita, about to go to Wales against Fiji. You'll probably see uh, a lot of uh, Welsh fans here behind me. There was uh, a couple of Welsh fans actually just came up saying that uh, they do watch us on YouTube. So be careful, sir, whenever you're slagging off the Welsh fans uh, in the future. You do have an audience of people who may be affected by uh, your snide lines about uh, Wales. Well. We're up against Fiji here in Oita tonight. Sorry, go ahead. Well, we'd all prefer if England were to win than Wales. I mean, we know that as a we statement of fact, right? <laughs> Put that to a few of them, perhaps, uh, after the game, uh, assuming they do assure their path into the knockout stages, which they probably will do. Like, I mean, Fiji and Samoa not into the similar situations this week, saying to disrupt a Northern Hemisphere team, saying to disrupt Wales tonight uh, is Fiji. This game should matter a lot more than it really does. Like, they lost to Uruguay, really kind of discovered this uh, as a huge contest from both sides. Uh, obviously, they both uh, named first-choice teams, uh, like uh, injuries uh, allowing and all that sort of thing. So it is going to be a, a top-class game, you'd imagine, uh, and Wales probably need to get some momentum under their belt going into the knockout stages. Probably the fourth-best team in the competition at this point, and they probably have that uh, position nailed down. You can't really make a case for them 
uh, in, in the top three at this point. Then again, you can't really make a case for any of uh, Ireland or Australia or France to be any better than Wales at this moment. So I think a semi-final is what uh, this crew is expecting. They've topped the pool and they've got France in a World Cup quarter-final, you expect. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd, give Wales, I'd say Wales could make the case that they're the second-best team. We'll, we'll wait and see until the... Uh, Semis uh, actually end up playing out. How are you getting on? So, where are you today in relation to yesterday? So, this is about an hour and a half uh, south. I uh, didn't get a bullet train, so it's uh, a sonic train, it was called. That's the next one down, and then below sonic, I think it's rapid. I'm not sure if there's anyone in between that, but it was the first time I was on a sonic train now. It took me along the coastline, and I was in Beppu for the afternoon. So, I came down here to Oita this morning, met uh, Shane Williams, did our interview, which is going out later, then went back up to Beppu because Beppu is a bit more interesting than Oita because it's got hundreds of natural springs, which are known as onsens. And I hadn't got a chance to go into an onsen while I've been here in Japan, but uh, sure enough, today I did get that opportunity. Unfortunately, it's not exactly the type of place where you can take footage because uh, there's just a lot of nudity going on. So uh, naturally, couldn't really broadcast that on, uh, on OTGAM this morning, but uh, I can tell you it was a very relaxing experience. The one I got in particular was uh, had a panoramic view over the beach in Beppu. So it was a day of hard work and uh, really putting in the graph for the show this morning. Right. I mean, you could have got footage and then you would have gone viral and, hey, you know, it's, we're all about the clicks, baby. <laughs> uh, potentially. I did, I did do a, a food review outside the Onsen Bath, so maybe that'll uh, go viral later on in the week. Who knows? Right. Uh, but yeah, that was, it was like, like it's, uh, they have some in Budapest. I haven't done the ones in Budapest, but uh, the ones here, pretty impressive. I think there's like 600 uh, thermal baths in this uh, little city alone, Befu, so... Uh, very impressive stuff. I, I did go into the first place and they were like, take off your shoes. And I actually kind of chickened out and I was like, I'm not doing this. So I kind of uh, mustered up the courage then, went for a bit of a wander around the city and then stumbled upon another place. They were like, take off your shoes. And then I took off my shoes and I was like, let's do this. So uh, yeah, job done. Did wear swimming trunks. So I chickened out of it completely. Right. And were you the only Irish journalist there or did like the Irish press back disrobe en masse and, and shock the locals? <laughs> No, I was, I was the only Irish. Uh, I was the only Irish journalist there. I wasn't. I don't think I was the only Irish person there, but I was. I was the only Irish journalist there for sure. Yeah. So it was sort of a. I was on a, a, a solo mission into Beppu into their uh, thermal baths this morning. Wow, this is getting weirder and weirder. On, but uh, you're going native, nativer and nativer. If, if that was a, even a word. <laughs> but it's uh, it's in all the guidebooks. I mean, uh, it's the, the last thing really tick off. You know, I've had the sake, I've had the tempura, I've had the sushi, I've had the Kobe beef. The last thing to do was uh, get my body into an onsen, and that I did. Here, Shane Williams, um, 25 minutes with him, so it must be good stuff. Yeah, very interesting stuff. I mean, we go back through the three World Cups that he played differing roles in. Uh, 07 kind of brings a win to Welsh eyes as it does to Irish eyes. When we speak about that, obviously, they went down the pool stage. It has particular relevance when it comes to this evening's game because they got beaten by Fiji, you'll remember, in an absolute classic the pool on that occasion and it was Fiji who progressed of course four years later Well, it came back also drawn against Fiji and spanked them 66-0 uh, but we also have bad memories of 2011 whereas Wales managed to correct things four years later 2003 was one of the topics that I was interested in because Shane Williams goes into that tournament as third choice scrum half comes out of it as one of the best wingers in the world so that's a very interesting tournament for him they should have beaten Wales I think most people will recall or should have beaten England uh, most people will recall uh, in that year's tournament in, in the knockout stages so painful memories again for him and it's interesting when we talk about the idea of 2011 we would take we would bite a Welsh arm off to take their situation in 2011 but yet he reflects on it with serious disappointment actually after Warburton sending off and losing a semi-final and I know it's a point in fairness you've made as well Ger, that you know winning a quarter-final should not be the thing that we pin our hopes on because all of a sudden your evaluation of what a success changes very quickly mm. as the Welsh can tell us but losing a semi-final I'd imagine even more painful than losing consecutive quarterfinals. Uh, Byron McGlynn on YouTube has been in touch to say, this little red lad is the star of the World Cup. He should have a travel show. It's uh, me or the lad behind me. I did manage to find my uh, doppelganger when I came outside. I was like, if I... Actually, it's not really my doppelganger. We have the same colour hair. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, that, that's about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, he probably means, means that guy. It's, it's, nice, actually, it's a nice little area here. Um, they, they, they've actually put Japanese rugby jerseys on a couple of the statues, like the, the old kind of European style uh, kind of cast iron statues and concrete statues uh, around this part 
of OITA, which is very interesting. And all the people, all the staff in the railway stations, all have Japanese rugby jerseys on, on game day. Uh, like I've been served by the same people in these train stations on different days. They go back to the uniform on non-game day, but on game day, everybody's in their Japanese jerseys. I am kind of a little bit surprised. I don't know why I'm surprised. Maybe it's me that this World Cup has completely taken over on a local sense. Like, I think this Ireland result has actually changed things. It's been noticeable since they got that win, since there was a huge chance now that they're in the driving seat to go into the last day, that this country is behind them. I think before them, before with that result, I think the country was kind of just a little bit uh, in a wait and see and dip the toe in sort of state of mind. And now they're all in and the place is buzzing. The amount of locals that are showing up for this game, for these sort of games, is incredible. Very good. What time's kickoff? Kickoff here is 6.45 this evening, so 8.45 a.m. Uh, no, that was 10.45 a.m. Irish time. So you got a, you got a little while before kickoff. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again later. What are your plans for the rest of the uh, next couple of days before the game? So we've got hopefully uh, another big interview coming your way tomorrow. We'll be looking to confirm that this evening, so I don't want to give away uh, the name just yet. Uh, up loads of uh, Samoa Ireland preview uh, team announcements. What day is tomorrow? Tomorrow's Thursday? Yeah. So yeah, team announcement day tomorrow. Uh, these weeks go by so bloody quickly. Nine day turnaround. The, the nine days are, are almost already up. You'll have uh, a full training session back for Ireland again. Captain's run of fourth on Friday. And then hopefully after that, it's kind of navigating your way back to Tokyo because it's going to be something of a navigation at this point. Like, I wouldn't be too confident that my flight is going to take off on Sunday considering it's destined for Tokyo because it looks like uh, that, that typhoon is destined for Tokyo at this point as well. Sunday morning, landfall time perhaps. And it could be Japan versus Scotland. That's the game under threat. All right. All good stuff. Thanks a million. We'll talk to you later. It's uh, on Sheehan there. It's a bit mad that um, the weather it might end up causing this uh, tournament such significant disruption. It'll be the best thing we have for, for our game. We might bring up that intensity for we, we play <laughs> but I think it's I think the weather the weather actually this is all stuff they must have thought about like because I mean the humidity especially. You would hope so, right? I keep going on about humidity but oh my god, it's an absolute nightmare to play in or to do anything in. Um, but yeah no I don't I, I I really don't think even that's a distraction. I don't think they've been thinking about it. Yeah, fair enough. I suppose you can't really because you've got to assume that they're going to fix it. Right, here's what's coming up. We've got Nod Breslin in the studio with us this morning, 7.53 a.m. We've got our first Japan dispatch. We're going to bring you through the sports pages of the newspapers in just a second. After that, Rugby World Cup 2019, we'll be back over to uh, preview some more stuff. Ireland beat Ukraine 3-2 last night before 5,500 people in Tallow. We'll talk with Ruth Fahey about that. John Heslin's going to join us around about 8.35 to talk about the fact that Westmead although drawn first against uh, Dublin, won't be having a home game in next year's Leinster Championship. As things stand, you're shaking your head. Shane Williams at 8.50, uh, Rich Tards Rugger coming your way at 9.15, and then Sports News with Phil around about 9.20. Um, so they should have a home game, you think? I think so. I was had one of my mates, Colin McCormick, said it's, it's the, between Westmead and Dublin, we've, we've won 15 out of the last 16 Leinster titles, so it's <laughs> going to be it's a fair enough uh, draw, I would have thought. Clash of the Titans. Yeah. Right, let's uh, bring you through the newspapers. I'm going to start with the Examiner this morning. Uh, pluck of the Irish, that's the uh, Ireland women's national team after the third goal went in. Uh, so we went 2-0 up, we got back 2 all from Ukraine after some bad defending and uh, bad goalkeeping error, and then 1-3-2, so... Um, Victory for Pau in her first game as manager. And Donald and Simone physicality will weigh heavily on Schmidt's mind. I mean, it is true that we're going to end up getting a tournament-ending injury for at least one and potentially two people from this game. Well, I don't know. People always think physicality is what brings injury, but the, the reality is when you know you have a physical game, like the, the, the thing about the, what really gets bad injuries is when you go, when you go, we don't go hard into your into your collisions. So yeah. You've got to actually commit to the collisions because uh, that's kind of the same aspect of the Irish Daily Mail is the saying that like that that we were talking about. That's what's missing and seems to be that level of 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 it's not even anger. It's 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 hard with rugby. It's it's I think. I've never, I never, I remember playing against Simone myself, and I took a, I was playing number eight at the time. Don't ask me why I ended up number eight, but I took a ball off top of a line out, and I'm in, in between the centres, and there was a skip pass between me coming, and I was like, I was coming as hard as I could go, like, and I wasn't the, like at the time, I, I was a big enough lad, and I, I hit a Simone centre, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't think I'm going to survive. I couldn't breathe for, couldn't, he hit me right there and I literally couldn't catch my breath and he didn't move an inch. And I go, my God, they're bred like this. So the Irish lads know this. I would be very, very, very surprised that the Irish team play face play the way they played against uh, Russia. Yeah, well, you've got to try and pass it on so that you... You're going to have to. Yeah. And I think what it'll be, it'll, it might be even one out, one, two out. And I think Conor Murray, 
will have to keep them a bit more honest. As, a, as I think the box kick, to be fair, every Irish team, I know it's worked well for us, but it's, it's, it, it's not like teams don't prepare for it. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game plan that we have, but I do think we, we need to keep defences far more honest because, if I, as I said, if I was playing six or seven, field day against that. It's well, we're not going to go out this weekend, are we? Oh, no. I, 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 I mean, if we do, like... like, <laughs> like like I can't even describe. If you, if you lose, Samoa are not a great team. No, they really aren't. They're not a great team. I mean, they sound like a better team than they might be. Yeah. When I heard people hear Samoa, they go, "Oh, they're definitely better than Russia. Not a million miles better than them." And um, you know, but they're definitely far more physical, and they'll definitely hurt you. So I, I would imagine Ireland will just. And at the end of the day, we need to, we need to, we, we need to just get through this game, get the bonus point. Yeah. And I do believe that that intensity is there. Yeah, okay. Back of the Daily Mail is a crazy call. This is Larry Tompkins. Uh, Larry Tompkins yesterday said the prospect of Cork not playing for the Sam Maguire next summer is crazy. The Munster Championship draw pitted Cork against Kerry in the semi final, which, if they lose, could potentially see the Rebels drop into a second tier competition. Because <clears throat> obviously they got themselves into their own trouble by ending up in Division 3. Um, but certainly it's not the draw that I presume the GA president wanted because now people see that the Tier 2 competition will be as stark as that if Cork in Division 3 don't make the uh, Munster final, don't be Kerry, then lo and behold, they're no longer in the um, Sam Maguire. Supermax escalate money dispute with Galway Board. So Supermax have doubled down on their statement last week by issuing another statement. Um, and um, they're saying they're seeking the transparency and accountability which are vital to confidence going forward. Supermax acknowledges that a lot of honourable people contribute at all levels of the GA, and whilst there are the beginnings of a necessary change in culture, the path forward cannot be laid until the issues of the past are revealed. So they're calling for uh, full disclosure of the Mazar's report and everything else that's happened, where the uh, money in Galway GA has gone. This is on the back of the last two candidates for the hurling job. Bear in mind, the hurling and football jobs are both open in Galway at the moment. Uh, Franny Ford and Noel Larkin withdrew their names from the race so as it stands there's not going to be a manager of the Galway Hurlers next year now maybe Supermax are going to end up getting me all the back that, that the, the, like the Supermax story is a very interesting one on, on McDonough on the, the governance stuff I mean straight away it's the same thing with the FAI if there's unsettlement anywhere it's going to put coaches off going anywhere near it yeah. it's just it's not governance is, it's become so critical yeah. in sport so it's, it's obviously it's a fair enough ask by uh, Pat McDonough if you're Porrick Joyce or there's a couple of candidates for the football um, you want the best opportunity because you're not going to get the opportunity to manage your county more than once more than likely so if now is not the time to be going in if there's going to be mayhem behind the scenes for a couple of years and why, also, why it, your time? it changes your life uh, in Gaelic. Like Gaelic is still for me, I adore it. But it, you're, you're either incredibly uh, lauded or, or, or support, or you're actually the, you can't go to your local spar for a coffee yeah. without getting abused. And if you, I wouldn't be taken on a squad if I felt there was unset, kind of unsettling feeling in, in in any capacity. Or if you weren't going to be able to afford the backroom team that yeah. all of your rivals have, because you know what Mayo have, and you know what Roscommon have, and you know what Dublin have, and you know what Kerry and Cork have. And if you don't beat those teams, well then you're a chump. And we have to stop this argument that it doesn't make a huge difference if you don't if you have that that, that ability. I haven't. I've been you know, I've been around Gaelic teams. Um, if you don't have full resource, Gaelic at, at that level is incredibly hard. You're going to work at, at you know we've heard these stories. You're going to work seven in the morning, probably before after a gym session, working all day, home straight onto the pitch, then back to your kids or wife or husband, whatever, and then you're. This idea that if you have stuff laid out for you, you have your meals, you have all this, it makes life a hell of a lot easier because ultimately at elite level, that's the stuff that stresses you. Yeah, is is not having your prep, and 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 knowing that other people might have that prep. So I think that's to me is is if you don't have that as a Gaelic team at whatever level you're at at this point, it's very very hard to compete, and that is an essential part of of, of sport. Yeah, well, when Tipperary were pointing out that they have a second bus for their backroom team, and they've won the All Ireland, and they're super professional, and they're being lauded for it, then everybody else must be demanding something similar from their county board. And if you're going in, your reputation is going to be defined. Your entire career is going to be defined by your success or failure as the manager of Galway. I was at a dinner in in Mansion House for the, like um, yeah. for the Tenio uh, thing, and, and which was it was really actually quite positive. They were like, "We're going to we we want to win this. We're going to make it everything work possible, do possible to make it win. Make every resource available, and that's what you got to do. If like you look at Dublin, have those resources Tipperary now, and they did I, it. They did it. And um, so I, it does make a difference. And they were lucky enough to have somebody who was that passionate about the county, but. I, 
you know, at the, other, at the end of the day, there's still an amateur sport and we have to figure out a way. And the argument being, I absolutely don't believe, say, for in the likes of Dublin, that Dublin should drop their standards. Dublin standards are the standards we need to find. Not everyone will get there or have that resource to get there. Um, I understand that. But the idea of telling teams to, to, to be to be worse yeah. is a silly thing to think about. Train I think. less. Train less, don't get as many. They're going to take what they have. I just think it's up to the GAA to figure out how do we, how do we narrow. And that's the look to the academies at the IRFU. That was a long-term game. That wasn't, you look at Westmead, where I'm from, is there long-term strategies there to develop the six, seven, eight-year-olds to by the time they come to John Heslin's edge, they're, they're at that level. And um, that's athlete sport. It's all a long game. It's not a, let's make our team better next year. It, that's not how, it's not going to happen. It's definitely not working at the minute. Right, the front page of the uh, Times this morning is Gordon Darcy's column. Right now, right here, Sexton simply must be on the pitch at all times. Um, I think Darcy's calling for him to uh, play the full game against, at least until the bonus point is secured. That's how we talk about these things now. <coughs> um, but I mean, the fact that he didn't play against Japan, the fact that he didn't play, the fact that Henshaw didn't play, the fact that so many players didn't play against Japan means that we could have a, quite a different team just simply because some players have not been in form by the time the quarterfinal rolls around, that you can actually get some confidence. But the other thing you is can talk yourself into a bit of confidence saying, sure, it's a different team now. I love, I, I do, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of all these, like, especially Darcy knows the stuff, he's been, in the, he's, been in the, he's been in the kind of middle of it, but I think nobody has the full context of the squad unless you're in the squad and you're around the squad and you know what's happening. You look at someone like Robbie, um, Robbie hasn't played a lot, uh, regardless of whether his hamstring is in good shape now. Um, even that quick hand-eye coordination stuff, that takes a few games to, to kind of build back up. Um, so I think with Johnny, um, I think at the end of the day, I think Carty's actually, when, he's, when he has played with a little less fear, he's been really good. Yeah. And then I even saw again in the Japanese game, he played with that first 20 minutes of fearlessness and it was actually glorious to watch it. And then something happened. And that fearlessness went, and maybe it was a leadership thing. I think with Johnny, what you're missing most on the pitches is leadership. Yeah. And leadership on a rugby pitch is crucial. Like Rory is obviously world class, but um, it's a different animal when you're running a backline. Yeah. And you need to. You could, but the backline against Japan couldn't. You couldn't run it because because the pack were being destroyed. Um, whereas against Scotland, it was good to watch. Even the phase play was good to watch because we were making ground. And we killed them. And we killed them. In physically. the first 20 minutes, yeah. it was it was over. So um, the phase play can work. It can work if your if your mm. if if your game plan's on point, and and it, it worked against Scotland to a point. But there was, if you watch the Scotland game back, there was that kind of they were they were petrified to 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 to, to kind of speed up the line speed because Ireland were threatening all the time, um, and we just haven't done that since. But we've played two teams that we probably underestimate. Well, one team we definitely underestimate. Yeah, for sure. Okay, three minutes past eight this morning. You're listening to OTBAM. Uh, stick or twist, Mick. Georgia versus the Republic of Ireland, and it's a picture of James McLean. It's D-Day for Ireland as boss Mick McCarthy decides what to do with his injury hit squad. It's a Paula Hare story. Big decisions for bosses. Injuries mount had a crucial ties. McLean last night remained a concern, having trained away from the main group owing to a back complaint. Shane Duffy and David McGoldrick will inform the Ireland boss today if they're fit to play a part mm. in the games against Georgia and Switzerland. So they're not in the squad now, but they can be supplemented ahead of tomorrow's two o'clock flight to Tbilisi. So um, it's getting to that point where we'll know basically after these two games whether or not we're going to be um, at least getting a playoff. I'd say all, literally every every kind of every, like everyone wants Ireland to be in the Euros. I mean, and like I'm talking more than the where it's being hosted. Um, I was talking about this last week about the the, the French and, and the difference the Irish fans made. I know this is a cliche at this point, but uh, with the Irish squad, I think Mick McCarthy is. I think he's trusted. You'd play for him. I'm actually even looking at the, the women's squad last night. This is another prime example of, so obviously with the FAI, the issues that are there, um, there'd, be a, there'd be an element of, of, of issues with, within it. Hopefully it fixes itself. But with, one thing I'm noticing with the Irish squad is even 5,500 people in Dallas last night. That, that's, that's a play that's been called over a period of time. They're, they're, they're looking at how do we build this game and it's starting to happen now. And we're starting to get these results and people are start, starting to really grab attention. But it was a strategy that was put in place to get to build, to build these kind of, to put five and a half thousand people. So I'm watching that these are things that we have to like, in terms of, to look, I was watching, watching it online, my mate had a, was, at, was at it last night and he said it was an incredible atmosphere. So these are, these are the positive things that are happening, um, and you have to kind of ask well, how they're happening. And we also have to be positive that the, the Irish squad are starting to get kind of some kind of relative kind of coherence together. Um, so there's a positive thing happening on the pitch. 
And there's a bunch back. of kids coming through who are really good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know enough about how the youth development works, but Rude Doctor has been there long enough now. The regional development squad's been there long enough now. That you're thinking it can't be a coincidence that. Um, all of a sudden we have players from outside Dublin starting to make it's it, it yeah. across the water. Like Your issue once again, though, Jerry, is it, it, once again, Ireland is this really strange... You, look, you look at the UK in terms of uh, developing players, the one thing that we have is the, the GAA. It has a, such a pull on young people, and so and in a really positive way, uh, and so has rugby. And so, so there's a bit, much bigger kind of competition. Look, at my case, like I got to 16, 17 years of age, and I knew at that point, you have to make a choice now. You cannot keep playing all sport, even though I loved all sport, and more, I wanted more than anything to play for my county. And there was one actually, in, in, when I, I, I went to rugby scholarship to UCD, and Westmead were in the All-Ireland semi-final. After winning the All-Ireland final the year before, and I got the call from like Luke Dempsey going, we, we want you to play. Right. And I was like, I, I will lose my scholarship. Uh, and I remember getting in front of my coach, I goes, I have to go. I, like, this is, you have to understand, this is my county, this is where my family live. I have to go and play that game. And he was like, no, you'll lose your scholarship if you do it. You're not playing that game. And it was uh, weeks and weeks of absolute torture trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And uh, <laughs> didn't think it was going to be on TV. And of course I said, like, you won't find out if I go down and play. So I went down to Leash. And I came on, and uh, it was, I remember it was raining, I was big white gloves, and like, you couldn't miss me. Um, so, but luckily I didn't lose my scholarship, but I remember thinking that, it, like, that was, no one else had that decision to make. That was on that my under 21? That was under 21, so that's me, yeah. Right, and, then, and, and so obviously the coach did find out at UCD and said, yeah. We kind of didn't do, do again, anything, like, or, the best part then is because Dave, Dave Billings, God rest his soul, was, was the, the, the Gaelic scholarship guy there, so he was like, I'll give you a scholarship, <laughs> so it was like, grand, so, but it was, it was at that point, I do remember having such, so many sleepless nights trying to figure out what I want to do, because I loved all sport, so you have that with soccer and GA and rugby, and you have these young kids who are talented and good athletes, and they have that pull, and the pull is generally coming from their, where they're from. Yeah, well, Aaron, Aaron Connolly, obviously, um, Superstar hurler mm. as well, apparently a very good footballer mm. as well, obviously, as now one of the brightest young talents in the Premier League. Um, so there was obviously always going to be a, a call on his services, and I, I think, I mean, obviously he's made the right call for him. Well, for me, it was more my dad had put five, through, five people through college, and he was like, listen, if you're getting your college fees paid, you're, or get your college, if you're taking a scholarship, you're not playing. Like, and it was, it came down to economics, and my dad was like, army officer, he was like, listen, it's tough to put kids through college. If you have an opportunity to have a scholarship here and you can you can fund yourself, yeah, you have to take. And that was this, the decision. And that's the issue, say with GA, that that will always become an economic call. Sometimes. Was it the right call for you, though, in retrospect? No. <laughs> was it no. not? No. No. I missed Gaelic every day. Right. When I when I gave up, I don't know why. It was actually it was Shane Lowry's dad was coaching the Westmead senior team when I when I um the 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 the, the year I had to stop, and. Like I love rugby, I adore rugby um, to a point, but I think when it became professional for me, my, my real love of sport started to die because it became very clinical. Yeah. You have to do this, and this is the rules, and this is the book, and this is the lineup move you have to make. And for me, I always loved playing rugby in a way that, like, obviously you need some kind of structure in what you're doing and stuff, but I, I was like, it kind of feels like I'm not, I have to just follow a kind of a rule book all the time. And what I loved about Gaelic football, and still love about Gaelic football, especially if you watch the All-Ireland this year, it's, it's, it's quite a simple game, you know, really, not, not in any way diluting it. It's a really simple game. I remember my, my, my coach saying to me, you've one job, that guy you're marking, you got a, you, 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 that's your, you, you have a role. And my first game at Westmead, um, I was young, quite fit, and was kind of at the kind of level of professional sport anyway. And I was coming up against, it was actually David Brady, <clears throat> Mayo. And it was, I was like, this guy's going to absolutely crucify me. And I remember the the guy playing with me says, if you try to mark him, he'll destroy you. Just keep running. Just keep running. Tired him out. Because that's all I could do at that point. And to be fair, David Brady was, well, listen, I'll run with you all day. Don't worry about it. So it was a rude awakening with me. But I do think, I, mi I miss it a lot. And I still, when I retired from, from Leinster, that day, that week, I got a call from Potty O'Shea. And Potty goes, listen, I heard you're retiring. Uh, do you want to come down and play with Westmead this year? I was like, why not? And I went down to the Westmead squad and Tomas O'Shea was the coach as well. Tomas O'Flaherty. Um, Tomas O'Flaherty, sorry. Yeah. And um, I, um, first training session, I was like buzz. I was so buzzed for it because it was a great buzz in the squad and I had a feeling the squad and luckily that year they won Leinster. And I tore my hamstring first session. And I just knew, I was like, I need to stop. I need to give myself a year off. My body's in bits. And was it a bad tear or was it like a... I, I, I'd been tearing muscles consistently. I had a double hernia, went into quad, ruptured quad, 
It, and, and, and anyone who's an, uh, played elite sport, the worst type of injury is a rupture. Uh, and mostly you never come back from one. Um, a bone break, you can kind of get back. Well, in the back of your head, psychologically, you're always going to find, is that going to go again? Because it is the worst pain I've ever experienced. And I've broken a lot of bones, was a rupture in my quad, my hamstring. So that was the end of it. And I, I remember the Leinster went on and won, 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 won Westmead won Leinster that year. And I was kind of, I was really upset that I didn't win a Leinster medal. I won a Leinster under 21 medal. And it would have been lovely to win a senior medal, but... Did they push you too hard? Did, did you push yourself too hard? What I pushed myself too hard. Right. I, I, I actually, I came straight from uh, fairly intent. I, it was all, all my injuries have, essentially my, my, my first rupture came from actually not being cared for. One thing I will say about the IRFU is they really care for their players now. They didn't have that together when I played. I came back from the Under-21s World Cup in Sydney. I played every minute of every game at that World Cup, and I think it was one of the only players who did. So my body was already put together with super glue. I was in ribbons and I had three days off. Like you need six weeks off at elite sport rugby, especially rugby. I had three days off and on the Wednesday I was playing Connacht for Leinster Senior Squad. I was offered a uh, Leinster contract the day I, I landed. So you had to take the contract because I had to, your job. But I, that's where my double hernia happened. I remember in the middle in of the game. pitch just being past the ball and just feeling this unbelievable dull pain in my stomach and going, what was that? I've never, it felt like an appendicitis almost. And I just dropped the ball and I, I had something seriously wrong here. And I, I didn't want to say it because I'd just been offered a professional contract. And I kept playing and then ultimately had to go for hernia operations, had the hernia operation, came back too quickly and ruptured my quad. And that was the end of my career. So uh, I was bad, it was badly managed. 21 at that stage? 20? 22. 22. Uh, yeah, and that, that was a bad management. And I've no resentment for it at all. You know, part of it was me not, not being, doing what a young person would do, going, I have to play through this. I, I want to show them what I'm worth. And the hardest part, I'll say, is about, like, I was watching my heroes, like people like Leo Cullen, who still is the best player I've ever played with. Um, he, I don't think he gets the credit he deserves as a player. And Brian O'Driscoll and Darcy and Shane Oregon, all these guys I, I was like, obsessed with and looking up to. And I felt like a taxi man with no car. I just couldn't show them what I was capable of. Um, because I, I, the minute I came into the squad, I was injured. And I, and I do have a bit of the idea that I, that was my biggest regret. I never got to go, listen, I'm actually, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm decent I at this. I deserve to be here. I'm decent at this. Um, and I think anyone who didn't play schools rugby always had that slight chip on their shoulder anyway. Yeah. So that was a tough thing for me to do. Okay, so did those injuries rehab for a period of time and then you just decide, you, do you never get back from them? Never played? I never, got, I never sprinted again after I tore up my squad, mentally. I never psychologically was able to, to sprint. I remember being, ga being given gas at the side of the pitch because it was that bad, it was a hole in my quad. And at the time, I, I, I was, it was in Leinster training. My, the Leinster bagman, John, uh, who I absolutely adored, he. Um, he had to carry me up the stairs in my apartment in Donnybrook. I couldn't walk, and it was in my gear. And for five days, I, I just sit, sat on my couch eating snack boxes, get my flat. I couldn't move. And I, the next day, I got a call from my physio. But then I got I got no kind of call from any of the the kind of team or the coaches. And I was like, Is this what we are? You know, I'm in, I'm a, and I was in a very dark place at that point because I was like, Jesus, like this is, and that's what, something we need with, 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 with elite sport and injury. Injury can do awful things to athletes. It can because they're not, they're not, they're told how to do everything, get more skillful, get more powerful, but not how to deal with that stuff. Especially when it's the first time you've had to deal with it. Oh, at that at that level where I kind of went, this is the end, and uh, it did it kept me out. And about six, seven weeks later, I attempted to come back from. Uh, up your quad, which was the most, it, because I had to, I forced myself. And so you I, hadn't I, had surgery, it was just rested? No, I, had, I, was, I was told I needed three months and I came back and then I, yeah, went again straight away. I, I was playing number eight for Leinster and picked up ball back of a scrum, saw the gap, went for it, bang, popped, um, and that was it. I knew, and that was the hardest part. Next preseason, I just knew in the back of my head, I am not at the races here. And that is, uh, that was a tough thing to do, but I don't blame anyone for that. You know, I definitely don't blame anyone for it. And it's definitely been something that's been addressed and fixed in, in the system. And I think anyone in the IRFU will but tell you. But it's such a waste of the resource that they've put into you in the first place not to treat you properly when you get you because the idea is that you bring somebody in, give them a contract and you want them to stay for 10 years as opposed to... That's not sport. The sport at the end of the day, like no matter what it is, the bottom line of any business is profit. The bottom line of sport is winning, 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 winning. But and they have much better chance of winning if they look after you. Yeah, they do. And, uh, but I think at the point being is, is at that time, I don't think that was really thought about. I remember Matt Williams saying to me, because I was quite a skinny lad at the time, I'm skinny now, but I, was, I, I put on the weight. But one of the sports scientist uh, uh, ideas was to tell me to eat a sliced pan every day. Right. To put on the weight, which I did, and I did put on weight. I'd say so, yeah. And maybe that's why it ruptured me. Slow down. Yeah, I didn't, I, I lost, because that, that was one thing I did. I was, I was I quite, I, I was 
getting a player quite quick, quite quite athletic, but then I lost that when I started eating Pat the Baker every day. I'd like say so, yeah. Literally sandwich after sandwich, and I'd sit there and I'd be crying eating it because oh I'm like, God. I can't eat any more of this shite. But it was, yeah, it was, that was it. The scientist in uh, inverted commas. Yeah, well, I, well you, you know, there was a bit of science to it, right? How long did you spend with Westmead then? About 20 minutes. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, was, I, was, I remember just walking off and I said to Moss, I said, listen, I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I, think I'm, I think my body needs to stop for a while. And he was lovely. He was grand. He just said, listen, it's, it's, it's really it's unfortunate. And I really would have loved, loved to have played a Leinster final. More than anything, even to come on for 10 minutes would have been a dream, but I didn't. What was party like? Some presents. I'll tell you that for nothing. I never, I remember he, he'd fly in in his helicopter and he'd land and he'd walk up and he'd just start talking. And, you know, it, it, that's, people talk about presence, not knowing what it is. Uh, it, whoever's met Potty realised that's what it is. Yeah, just have to listen to it. Even sometimes you're going, oh, for God's sake. It's still, yeah, this guy has it. And, and I can see why. And let, making Westmead win in Leinster is no mean feat. Um, and that was a good Leinster. We, we, we deserved to win that one. So it wasn't like we just fluked really. Yeah. Fluked one or two of them. But, so did Dublin. Yeah, no, that's so you had a bunch of different interesting coaches. So you had Matt Williams, who else? Declan Kidney, Poddy. Poddy, yeah, I mean, if, I, if to break them all down as, as coaches, I mean, it's, it's um, and Luke Dempsey was a really, really good coach, another guy with a great presence. Um, but like for me, Matt Williams was very professional. Gary Ella was then, was, yeah, he came into Leinster. I don't think he enjoyed it. Uh, I don't think he quite had the, the, what's the best words, at the hold of the group. Yeah. And I think, to be fair to Matt, Matt had the hold of the group um, and he lost it. And I'm not sure why, but I think the senior players started to kind of see, he was, not that he, he sometimes Matt had a, an incredible ability to tell you what you wanted to hear. And sometimes you need to hear stuff that you don't want to hear. Um, and there was a bit of that. But then I have to say, um, something that's really important to me is that of everything I've ever played, as I mentioned, Neil Cullen, he was the, the ultimate leader. Um, it makes absolute sense to me that he is as good as coach as he is um, and how he is the respect of the squad like he has. What, what, so on a day-to-day -day basis, what was it that impressed you so much at the time? It just, Leo didn't care who you were or where you were. Like he just didn't, he didn't have that about him. He just had this incredible, there was a, there was a, there was a click in Lens. It always was like, you know, any of the players will tell you, anyone who's in the squad, maybe some of the Gary Browns and players would have played it when I was playing. And, there was definitely that involved, and Leo went to Leicester. And the story, when Leo came back from Leicester, Leicester, he was like, we're not going to win anything unless we fix this, unless we figure out how to have... The world culture is thrown around a lot, but unless we figure out how to do something, and Shane Jennings was the other player, they, they went away and went, this isn't happening. And we have the team to win it, but we don't have this, this type of, this culture change. And I think Leo was the guy who kind of really instilled that. Um, and playing with them was a different, he was a... Like, he controlled, the, he dictated the game. So if he wanted to slow the game down, he was brilliant at that. You wouldn't see that stuff, but it was very, very clever stuff. I remember playing against, um, he was Clinetley in the Celtic League, or whatever, whatever it was called, and he, the ball was kicked off. And he, he just said to me, he just said me, he told me to run past the ball. That's all I remember him saying, just run past the ball. I was like, I can't, my job's to compete. Ran straight past the ball, and whatever happened, it landed in my hands. I was like, this guy's like, like, how did you know that was going to happen? And he had it all covered up, but it was just, he was just a great leader um, and, an, and a lovely lad, lovely man. Um, and if I was playing now, I'd play my arse off for him. I, you know, I put, I would, and that's what you want from a coach, I think. Yeah. You talked about the, um, Kidney was in charge of your under 21. 19. Under 19, uh, sorry. It was Kieran Fitzgerald was my under 21. Okay, so Kieran yeah. Fitzgerald, right. Yeah. The, that under 21 team um, finished third in the World Cup? Uh, no, fifth. Fifth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was... We actually were good. We were re we were a really good squad. We should have beaten England. We nearly beat the All Blacks. Um, Gavin Hickey got sent off for punching an 140 kilo number eight. Um, I was telling him beforehand when he when he punched him, he kind of looked to us going, "Here, lads, back me up." We were like, <laughs> we were just whistling, walking the other way, singing the Great Escape, going, "I'm out, lads," because we, we yeah he, they were massive. But we were, that was a prime example of maybe a squad that didn't have loads of stars but played really well together. Um, that was a good New Zealand team. They had uh, a famous leader amongst their, their numbers, so Richie McCall's team. Richie McCall, uh, he, he was player of the tournament I think that year. And, and the thing about Richie that really used to stri strike me, but Richie wasn't a big guy. He didn't appear that big uh, under, under 21s. Like I, I used to look at him going, 
Jeez, you could you could take him on like you yeah. could hit him, but like you hit him, it's just game over. Whatever it is about him, and he became quite a bit. He was never massive. He was never like at that level. But I think he was a prime example of 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 rugby not necessarily being about it's about being incredibly athletic and powerful, and aggression, and, and aggression. And his if you watch Richie play, it's two things that was most it's, it's his it's his uh, it's angles. It's, he's all about angles and how he comes in on the ball. And he plays. To be fair, Richie played fifty percent of his uh, of his professional uh, career, um, bordering on utterly illegal. Oh, totally, yeah. Uh, and he, he knew, he knew how to play it, and the way he played the referee. But um, yeah, he was incredible. Aaron Major, the other half, he was playing. He was the big, the big, the big cheese then. Yeah, a couple of incredible players. But we 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 should have, you know, we beat Argentina quite well. We beat South Africa forty three forty two. Right. Uh, which was uh, one of the best games in sport, I think it was 42-41. And at the point, I remember having, in that game, I had mask and, ta mask and tape at this point, and, and each elbow and each shoulder, I couldn't, sh I couldn't bend my arms because we were that, I was that bad at the right. end of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was in the middle of the game, they were, they were they literally taking you up. Saying, they were like, you were the, I was the main line-out option, they couldn't take me off. Right. Uh, it's 8.21 this morning, Niall Breslin is with us, uh, if you're listening to us on the Go Loud app, yeah, that's where OTV Sports Radio lives. Um, a reminder about the 15th of October, we're bringing you something very special from the Borgash Energy Theatre in Dublin. It's the very latest in our Off The Ball Roadshow series. Brian O'Driscoll, Keith Wood, Michael Lyon, Bobby Skinstat, Malcolm McKelly, Paul Howard and Danny O'Reilly. It's going to be a smashing show. It's all in association with Heineken, official worldwide partner to Rugby World Cup Japan 2019. Visit drinkaware.ie. We're back talking about the Irish women's national team at Ruiz Fahey in just a minute. First, here's the new Ireland boss, Vera Pau, happy after a maiden victory. It, it, amazing. Uh, we made it very difficult for ourselves, actually, because we were 2-0 up. We had the game in our pocket, actually. And um, because of two individual mistakes, we suddenly are under huge pressure. Um, so that third goal, um, they they had this absolute will to not give the win away. And uh, we had already um, prepared what we would do if the pressure would get too high. So one shout was enough. They executed it fantastic. Yeah, I noticed in the second half you were trying to scream with your, your hands around your mouth for the players to hear you with the record crowd and lots of young girls screaming. It was sometimes hard for your players to actually hear you. They didn't hear me. I had to use all my voice and they did not hear me. So, so uh, that's a good thing. You cannot say like, one more, I need to coach. <laughs> yeah. But that is a good thing. Eh? So one time I asked the players, who has a, hard vo a loud voice? Can you call me <laughs> Yeah. And like at half time, your team are 2 0 up. Um, your captain, Katie McCabe, scores again. Player of the match, Rihanna Jarrett, gets a great goal. You're 2 0 up in 28 minutes, and then you make two mistakes and they equalise before half time. And you probably had to calm the players down at half time, given they'd kind of thrown away a lead. Yeah, yeah, because of course they came in the dressing room uh, angry and. And um, not to the to the players with mistakes, but that they were giving it away. So, indeed, we calmed them down and we just repeated what we've done this week. What were the points that we agreed? Restructure, reorganize, get the lines closed, get that four block working, and um, that helped. I think in the second half we were the better team again. We were in control, um, but of course, three two down. Uh, they played four up, then they played five up. That means that you need to have five back. Um, that was organized, but that also means that there's no players anymore to play. So, you, you, yeah, the long balls gave us a lot of pressure. Yeah, I interviewed Megan Campbell three or four times in the last four years, and she's had such serious injuries, and, and she's come back. And, like, her long throw tonight on both sides, and she had the space with the, you know, the stand to the sideline, and her long throw in the second half was very different to the ones in the first half in that it created the chance for Rihanna to cross it in for the young goal and that's a massive, massive threat for your team. It is a weapon, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's what we said uh, on the bench. But also, we haven't really trained it. Only uh, two throws uh, so that everybody could feel how far she could throw. And then coming from back, the, the moments that she threw it over, the only thing that we needed to say is don't do it every time. Have a good look. Is it on? You do it. If it's is it not on that? And if you see it, have contact with each other so that Rian knows. Uh, amazing. This is this is coming out without training. That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, massive. And you know the crowd as well was massive. Five thousand three hundred twenty-eight, I think. And the FAI had hoped there'd be eight thousand here. And I think some season ticket holders maybe didn't take up their tickets. And there were some empty seats. It's still a record crowd. But are you disappointed that it wasn't the eight thousand that we'd hoped it would be, given that there were eight thousand tickets given out? 
Well, this point, it, it is a shame. It's a shame because we've been absolutely clear, hand in your tickets, because there were so many people wanted to come who couldn't come mm -hmm. because there were no tickets available. And that is really a shame. Maybe we need to think about a different way because those people will stay, will, they, they will come, everybody will come. And um, to get the stadium full, we maybe need to think of how, how can we organize that. But, but people have done a phenomenal work to get that all the all those tickets um, being picked up because people had to download them they had to to how do you say that to to receive request, them to take them yeah to request them yeah, to yeah. get them um, so it's just a shame that they then then not come yeah it's um no, not a down note to end on but like a positive you would hope that maybe people will actually use those seats uh, next time around Ruth Fai is with us Ruth good morning to you good morning guys how are you yeah. Good. That was um, a pretty interesting game. <laughs> I feel, you know, <laughs> if you want excitement, uh, come to the Irish women's national team. 2-0 up, suddenly 2 all. It's like, oh, Jesus, what's going to happen here? But um, grind it out 3-2. Sometimes victories like that are actually more important than a routine 2-0 would have been. A hundred percent. I suppose that's one way you could definitely look at it. And I suppose the fear was there. Um, we've seen before with this Irish team, it's gone one or two up, conceded goals. And in addition to that, conceded really poor, sloppy goals, which was the way last night as well. We've seen the heads go down and we've seen them capitulate in the past. But what was so refreshing and so positive about last night was that they went out in the second half and they still continued to go for it. They still played the same way they played in the opening 25, 30 minutes of the first half. They didn't sit back, they didn't absorb the pressure. That's what they would have done in, in the past. But we've heard Vera Powell speak in the run to the game that she wants to work their strengths. And the strengths of the likes of Katie McCabe Denise O'Sullivan, Rihanna Jarrett is to attack, get on the ball and utilise what they can do. Um, so that was really refreshing. And because of that, they forced the error. They forced that own goal in the opening stages of the second half. And at that stage at 3-2, like I said, we've seen that fall away before. But they managed to hold relatively solid and going into the final 10, I didn't feel that we're going to concede again. So like you say, like you can get so many things from that, the resilience that they showed. And, and the main thing for me was the positive play for the majority of the game. Really, really refreshing. I think too, um, when you change managers in the middle of a, a competition like this, there has to be a little betting in period, and that's the betting in period now for the new manager. She's seen what the team can do. They've come through the other side, and again, like she now knows exactly what the team need to work on for the next time. Yeah, exactly, and you've got to give Vera Powell massive, massive credit. She's had such limited time to prepare the team, and to come in in the manner that she did literally at the pinnacle of the, of, the, of the group where this is literally the most important game in the opening five games. If you're looking ahead, you're looking at Greece in November, Greece again after that in Montenegro. So really you're looking at wins, three wins in a row. And then you've got Germany twice and Ukraine again with Germany at the very end. So really you're, we want to go into that German game at the very end, having known you've done all you can to secure that best second place position. But for Vera Pella to come in, she's had... I think she had a week of training with the girls. Um, I thought of the first 11 that she picked was really, really solid. It showed kind of expertise that she had garnered from all the people that she had consulted around her. She'd spoken to Colin Bell, Tom O'Connor. Eileen Gleason has come in and given her all the information I think that we need. And you could see that relationship already fostering last night. Gleason and Powell look really close. Like, they were really nice scenes, just hugs, just, just pure celebration as well. They didn't hold back. It was really nice to see, but... I think her selection was perfect. I think that bringing in Megan Campbell for Harriet Scott showed a really prudent decision. I thought Campbell was actually stand out. A lot of credit went to the likes of Denise O'Sullivan, Katie McKay, Brianna Jarrett. I thought Campbell was really solid at the back as well. But uh, hopefully, did you guys get to see, did you see Rihanna Jarrett in action? It's probably the best game I've ever seen her play, regardless of whether it's Westwood Youth or Ireland or whatever. She was absolutely superb. Yeah, and ends up with the reward of the goal as well. Um, with an assist for the first one, goal for the second one. The first goal is a, like a real thing of beauty. Yeah, 100%. Um, and it's those moments, like we've seen that in flashes, and I mean minor flash in the last campaign, as we all remember Colin Bell had his plan. He wanted to have a campaign where they just completely solidified their defensive ability and then flashes of attack. But we saw that in a, in a lot more abundance last night, and it was that first goal. Denise O'Sullivan got a bit of space, as she always does, picked out a beautiful pass for Jared on the left. Jared wouldn't be renowned for her pace, but she looked pacey last night. She's got a spring in her step, pulled it down the left and pulled it back perfectly for Katie McCabe. And literally, the person you want to fall on their left boot, and she just sliced it, cycled it into the corner. And from there, Rihanna seemed to push on. Like I don't know if people listening in are, are aware of Rihanna Jarrett's story. She's had 
three ACL injuries. She had those three injuries by the age of 22, which is outrageous. Like she's, she's 25 now. She bounced back last year with her, her very first year of a full season of fitness. And with that, she scored 27 goals in Women's National League, went on to claim Player of the Year. And now she's actually pushing on. She's, you can literally see her in her prime and her confidence grow as the game went on. She was involved in all of the goals. She got one main assist, second indirect assist, and of course got the second goal. And she completely deserved it. Uh, it was just... Yeah, it was, it was actually really emotional, emotional just watching her claim that player of the match award and, and watching her in the interview after. It's just absolutely so happy for her and so proud of her as well. So look, we, we should talk about the crowd. It's, it's a great thing that um, everybody took up their tickets. It's a terrible thing that there was 2,000 empty seats when there was clearly demand. Because I actually know some people uh, who wanted to go to the game were like, oh, this is sold out, I want to go to the game, but it's sold out and I can't get a ticket. The, I don't know, like, it's a quantum leap forward to have five and a half thousand people there and by all accounts Niall you were saying your mate was at it and the atmosphere was great Incredible, yeah. so we just yeah. need to get to a situation where you can trade your tickets if you're not going to use them or don't take up the allocation if you don't want it because it's clear that there is demand for this now exactly complete nail on the head like and you know I, I won't deny it I was really pissed off just looking around at the crowd last night because in the last couple of days we've had all this I suppose publicity about this 8,000 capacity sellout, it's going to be a massive record. Of course it was, we had 5,328 and that's huge in itself but I'm, like, I'm trying to get my head around and understand how the system actually works. They said 8,000 sold slash claimed season tickets so is it a fact where people actively claim it or is it default position if you don't claim it then your ticket is gone because I saw on Twitter like n not even individuals but we had the likes of managers at underage clubs with 20 girls that wanted to go and they've asked the FBI for tickets and couldn't get them. Um, I saw that a couple of times on my Twitter feed. Like, it has to be looked at. And we heard Vera Powell, she called it a shame and that we need to think about it a different way. And it just, it just ha has to be re-looked at because, as you say, with a game like that, a huge three points, the next home game against Greece is next year. People are going to want to go. And if they start to publicise this as a sellout again, people are going to start to become sceptical. So it just needs to be really clear... Mm what's the allocation for season tickets, what are, what are the tickets for sale, and even at this stage, looking at bumping up prices or whatever, like it's just a different strategy that needs to be embraced this way, but that was a real shame, that's not to take away, it was a record 500, and, sorry, 5,328 people there. And I think what you're saying, that Ruth, it is strategy, this is strategy that's required, and not just on the, yeah. you can see some of it is working, you know, the, the mm -hmm. idea is like, I, the, the, even though there was issues with tickets, there was a buzz on my, say, my social media last night, Stuff like that, and that that is growing, and there is progress there. But the strategy is is it seems to be that that is just it's not it's not it's not acceptable. There's many tickets three two 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 and a half thousand that didn't 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 actually turn up that were sold out sold out. It's the same even in music. They do this thing where they go, oh, the gig is sold out, and people go, oh, I can't get a ticket, and then no one turns up, and then you go, oh, well, there's, where is everybody? <laughs> yeah. This is horrible, yeah. and, and, it, and it does. It can that can that can, that can affect the mindset of a team or a player, or especially the new coach coming in. Well, think of the difference of an extra two thousand voices. All clearly Irish people, not Ukrainians, yeah. who are shouting for Ireland. It's an extra fifty percent in the atmosphere again, which is already good. I, it makes them. It makes it, but also it's it's this idea. It's the momentum that needs to build because, like at the end of the day, athlete sport. That that I don't think crowds actually understand the power they have over teams. They really do, like especially if the team is down and it's two all, two all, and there's that little bit of a bite left in it, and you need you need that pick up. It makes a massive difference. And obviously, some of those people who didn't turn up, there was reasons for it, but not two thousand of them. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's not that's not how how it works. Yeah. So uh, that aside, Ruth, all in all, a uh, fairly positive outcome in the end. I mean, look, clearly uh, goalkeeping issues, some defensive issues that need to be sorted mm -hmm. for the next game too. Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't shy away from that. Uh, it was after the howler from where you were and to concede that first goal like it was just a straightforward collection into the hands just seemed to take her eye off it or didn't seem to get her hands in the correct position behind the ball it bobbled in and they finish and the second goal then to make it 2-1 well, Megan Connolly an error in her part just didn't didn't connect with the clearance and, and they <laughs> they took full advantage of that um, so that's where my heart kind of sank because like I said we've seen those moments before and the fact they responded so well it's commendable but Vera Powell didn't hold back either. She said that we completely brought that in ourselves. Um, I would like people to, to not shy away from that. It was, they were two absolute huge errors, the first one in particular. And unfortunately, we've seen that before from our goalkeeper in big games. Like that could have, you know, you don't want to underestimate it. That could have completely pulled the campaign apart, but it didn't. She did redeem herself in the final moment. She pulled off a crack and save to mm. keep the game at 3 2. 
Um, but that will leave that will leave some headaches for Pau. Does she want to stick with her? Does she want to look at Grace Maloney having a stellar season across the water? Do you think that um, had anything to do with the fact that the two goals that Ireland scored were so, such in quick succession? But I think sometimes when that happens, you can you can lose the run of yourself. You're like, oh my god, this is a this is a festival, and then you switch off for for, for a second, and, and stuff like that happens. Usually, if the goals are kind of you know first half, second half, you, you, you're on all the time. But I often feel in sport, you, you can get a bit too excited too quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely don't think that's an excuse for, mm. for the error, the the, the the level that it was at in the in the. In the First, certainly for the first goal, it was just a really straightforward collection. Um, Horton had been involved in the game already at that point. Um, so it, I don't think it was a mental thing. I'm not sure what it was, but look, she'll deal with it, move on, and, and again, go into the next game. All right. Fair enough, Ruth. We'll leave it there. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Thanks, guys. Have a great Cheers, day. Ruth. Catch you later. Ruth, I'll give us some analysis on the 3 2 win for Ireland last night. Two tries, two quick tries for Scotland in uh, the game against Russia, it's slightly against the run of play. Um, Russia have definitely been in the uh, Scottish 22 a fair bit and looked decent and it was nil all after 10 minutes but then two quick fire tries. Um, the second one had many good chances oh of the ball for yeah. Scotland. It was a scrum half there. Oh God, he's going to want to see that video analysis. That's, uh, that's oh. our team, yeah. He's going to blame the studs, is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. It was an unfortunate, uh, the silly... Um, Slipped basically. And I think Scott will beat Japan. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I thought they had a chance. That then looking at this, they've been, they've been abysmal. They're twelve 0 up. They're about to go fourteen 0 up. But they've. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Scotland beating Japan. Whatever that does, does. But I, 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 I think they will. That gets us back into a game against the, uh, the Springboks. Uh, to wrap up our coverage of the women's national team, here's the Ireland and Man City star Megan Campbell chatting to uh, Jamie after their win last night. Have a look. Loved uh, the week really positive, uh, no fear of failure. It was the main aim this week and um, just to build on that as a, as a team and as a squad going forward was more positive play in, in us going forward in our formations and going into games knowing that we can come out res with results rather than playing on a, um, on a draw or whatever and, and yeah, I think that the training sessions have been good. They've been lighter, but Vera's like, well, obviously she's a great professional and knows what she's doing and, and everyone's bought in and I know it's only been a week, but we're looking forward to the next camp in November. Yeah, the crowd tonight, 5,328 off the top of my head. We're hoping for 8,000 and whatever happens, season tickets not coming or whatever, but for you guys to have that record crowd and again, spend the time at the end with the, with the young girls and boys taking selfies and autographs and stuff in Dublin, a big crowd and, and hopefully to build on that for the next one. Yeah, definitely. I don't think without that crowd being there and without everyone singing ole, ole, ole at the end, like we could all hear it on the sidelines um, coming in onto the pitch and we're just obviously delighted that the crowds have turned up. I think it's on us as players to keep building now and keep performances on so that the crowds keep coming back, but... Yeah, just really thankful for everyone who's come out and supported us and hopefully it long may it continue. And lastly, it was really interesting when Vera told me last week that you were going to train against boys and with boys and you played the UCD 15s in that unbelievable Sport Ireland Dome during the week. Tell us about that and I'm not sure if you yourself as a, a women's footballer have played kind of against boys or against men and, and you know Vera's thought process on that and how it went. Yeah, many would say that obviously boys are more physical, obviously faster, it's, it's the obvious thing and so for us to want to build and to play possession football we need to do it against a high fast moving opponent um, because that's the only way you're going to get better. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes but that's what the training games are for and um, thankfully UCD boys came and they played us in the indoor arena in Abbottstown and um, it was good, it was a good opportunity for the girls to get to play together for Veer to see players. It's Megan Campbell there speaking with uh, Jamie in the aftermath of that victory last night. So you'd hope that they can sort that ticketing thing out. There should be a fairly easy way to, if you are a season ticket holder and you don't want these tickets, don't claim them. Or you have until 24 hours before kickoffs to claim them, then we put them on general release. Well, they have to talk about how, what, what was the problem first before they, they try and fix it. How did that happen? Um, and that's, that's the thing about it, isn't it? It's no point in getting angry or, or frustrated. It's actually, well, how do we fix this? What yeah. do we do? How do we make this better? And the school, the school girl, school boy thing is a good option. How do you get you know, that, because that's how, that's how the Leinster, even Leinster rugby, because remember, <laughs> Leinster rugby, no one would come to our games. Yeah. I swear to God, we used to go crazy if a thousand people were at one of our games, like amazing, and now you can't get a ticket for it. But that was years and years and years of, of developing the kind of PR and the strategy around it. So I think that's the same commitment that has to be, has to be driven towards this. All right, I want to move on to one of the other big stories. This is uh, very relevant to you, given your background. Um, the Leinster Council are apparently pouring cold water on Westmead's hopes of hosting Dublin in next year's championship. And I'm delighted to say we've got John Heslin, uh, the second Westmead man on the show this morning. So you guys are taking over. John, good morning to you. Good morning, lads. How, How are you, John? What's the crack? He's been up since half four milking cows, I'd say. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Not this morning. Not this morning. 
Come here, when the draw gets made against Dublin and you guys come out first, what are you thinking? I, I, I didn't think you were actually going to bring me on to talk about that today. I thought you were talking. You were going to talk about the flan in Mullingar. Ah. I thought that's what we were promoting. <laughs> that's the second hour, John. We're on, we're on 9 to yeah. 10. When is the flan? Oh, God. I, I, I thought you were kind of... You know, I'm getting myself and Bresley on because of our musical exploits, how good we are. You know, we're both very talented musicians that I was going to be talking about the flag. He's not lying. John and John knows. <laughs> so. You think about the flags, the flags like people like, and it, um, we're, me and John are obviously very, very proud Mullingar, Westmead men. Um, um, we don't get a lot, you see. It's kind of sometimes Westmead's forgotten about, or the Midlands is forgotten about. And that's right, even yesterday in the budget, look, we after getting a, we're getting, <laughs> Pascal Dunne, who actually mentioned uh, the Midlands, which was lovely. Um, so, and that's not a chip on our shoulder, by the way. So having the flat <laughs> in Mullingar, the place is lost. We've even dug up the whole town right. and rebuilt it <laughs> and put all these new paths in. When is the flat? 2020. All right, okay, yeah, so it's loads a big time deal for us. Yeah. And John, what, what are you doing in the flat? What's, uh, what's your party piece? I can't. I can't announce that yet. I'm doing a. There's a PR stunt around that and a big marketing campaign to, <laughs> to really announce what I'm doing at the flat. So I don't Mike want to reveal all yet because we still are only in 2019, <laughs> which probably will lead me on to my first point of uh, the fixture with Dublin. It's a bit mad, isn't it? Really, that we're talking about the 2020 championship. It's probably a little bit unfair on the Dubs. They're not getting to enjoy their uh, their five in a row. We're already talking about the championship in 2020. <laughs> I'd say they don't. Poor Dubs. They're, they're <laughs> unconcerned about where this fixture ends up being fixed, and that's the whole point. I think that Dublin would be absolutely delighted to go to Mullingar because why the hell wouldn't they? It's no, it's no odds to them where they end up playing. We built the street. The streets look great again because the flat that will be welcomed in. People love. It's only 50 minutes from Lucan. It's got lovely. You know, I think the Dubs would be. I'm going to ask the Dubs to. Refer, like this is the thing about it is like the, the the buzz that would create for Mullingar to play the Dubs first round of championship in. Would be it would be amazing, and I think that's the thing about it is it's like it the, the difference it would make, and also like you know it's it, to have them in your back back you know back room is is obviously going to give you a little bit more of a chance of taking on the might of them. John, yeah, you so know that, a little yeah, bit better. I'm going to go one step further and even say that I'd say that lads, the Dublin lads, don't, didn't even know the draw was made. Yeah. Judging by their Instagram, them lads are travelling the world at the moment and having a great time, and and rightly so, more power to them. But I'd say they don't even know the draw was made. Uh, so, you guys obviously want a home game, right? I was actually, well, of course, yeah, we'll take a home game. I played them down in the field on the farm, if that's, if that makes us going to beat them, you know. But, um, look, I was looking back at the last quarterfinals. I don't think quarterfinals are home draws anyway. Mm. Is that, am I correct in saying that? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so the details are... Year, I think Carlo and Kildare... The draw was reduced. Carlo and Mead was in Port Leash. West Mead and Leash was in Tullamore, as was Carlo and Kildare. So I, I get, Kildare. Sorry, I, I have it here. Patty was speaking with uh, Willow Callan last night. The draw was to produce four fixtures for the quarterfinals. <coughs> it wasn't made with first team out being home. It's not a case of West Mead losing a home game. Quarterfinals are at neutral venues unless there's already a home and away agreement in place between the counties involved. Now, I mean, it feels to me like everybody has a an away and away agreement with the Dubs because you always play them in Croke Park. And certainly you have done yeah. for the last two decades. So why yeah. would you have bothered? So, so the agreement, so, so if himself and John start texting some of the players to see if they're cool with it, that, is that enough <laughs> for the Leinster Council? And so we say, listen, they're up for it, so can we play it that way? Well, Jerry Egan has been out and he said that he wants to um, have the game in Mullingar for next season. So I, I think that actually there is a chance here for everybody just to Draw breath. The, the Leinster Council are saying that it's a health and safety issue, that they'll have a bigger capacity in Tullamore and be able to deal with a bigger crowd. And yes, we all know that if the crowd is the crowd, then that's the number of tickets that you sell and some people won't be happy with it. But actually, yeah, yeah. that's how life is. Like, that's why some uh, home grounds are smaller than others, but so be it, that's fine. Like, there's no reason for the Westmead County Board and the Dublin County Board to have sat down 25 years ago and said, let's do home and away. Because no. it... Like it's, also, not, it's not part of that culture. Take sport out of it for a, a second, which you probably shouldn't. Even for commerce of a town like Mullingar, that you know, every everything like that would be really, be, really helpful. You're, you're stuffing a stadium. There's a buzz in the town. You've got the flag that year. All that kind of that that does help. Like it really does help, and it can help maybe businesses who who go like if we're getting 12, 13, 14 thousand people into a stadium or whatever it is we get in, and there's a buzz around the town. That's really good for even for one day, two days. So. I think, yeah, I think at the end of the day, I mean, the health and safety thing is something they use a lot, uh, and I, I get it to a point, but, you know, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a very easy get-out-of-jail-free card sometimes for them. Yeah, John, there was a Kerry game in 2012, I think, that um, 
was a, a big game for Westmeath. Yeah, we nearly knocked Kerry out of the championship that day and then Darren O'Sullivan decided to come off the bench and put the ball in the back of the net. I remember um, that. Oh God, I, was yeah, I, never, I never really got to thank Darren in person for that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a great game. Like, you know, we had Kerry, you know, one of the all-time great teams, played a, played a game. They were down in, in Cusack Park and it was a great atmosphere around. And as I said, we, we actually nearly beat them that day. Um, but, you know, I echo everything that's said there and especially, you know, Jerry Egan said that he, he wants them in Mullingar. Of course, we want to be playing the game in Mullingar. But including sport into what Brezzy just mentioned, like the buzz that it creates for the younger people. Like, mm. we all know that the Leinster Championship has been one-sided. Uh, Westmead got the two Leinster finals. Perhaps in a, in a different era, could have won one of those finals. And obviously that creates... Look, I was, I was a young kid when Westmead won the Leinster Championship in 2004. And that, that, you know, encouraged me to continue the game. Bringing the likes of Dublin and the stars that they have and, you know... Arguably, some of them are the greatest players ever to play the game. Like the buzz that that would create for the people, the young kids of Mullingar and Westmead, you know, you can't even put a value on that. Like, and it's disappointing that it's not even being considered to be Mullingar. So, and when you look, we I were speaking about John, the the idea that a Gaelic and hurling and and rugby and so at that level, young people want influence. Like uh, right now, the big influence is, is rugby is such a huge hole in the country, and young people all around Mullingar. Just, I mean, there's hundreds of young people going out playing rugby in Mullingar, a club that was struggling for a while. And that kind of injection in how rugby took off. And it's the same with GAA. If you, if you can influence young people, we're kind of going, you know what, actually, that was some buzz. I, rem I, remember, I remember these. I remember being brought to see Mullingar play in the Towns Cup final, and Joe Schmidt was centre for Mullingar. And I remember just the buzz at the Towns Cup final. And I remember saying to my dad, I want to play rugby. That has massive influence on young people. So th I'm not overselling this, but like if you get into the town, you bring, as, as John said, the best players, whoever played the game, the, one that, like, the best team that ever played into the town and out and grab that buzz. It will, it will make a difference. And some people will go, oh, why should Tullamore not have that? But actually, it's not the same because it's not awfully playing them. It's not awfully playing them. It's best Mead against Dublin. And it's, it's important. And, and, and to be fair, to, to, it's a great stadium in, in Tullamore. They get a lot of great games. Um, Cusick Park doesn't, and it's important that we, we, we kind of we just stand up for it. I mean, whatever the Lens Council decision is final, I hope not. But um, well, it, I mean, the, the point that the Lens Council make is that there's no home and away arrangement between the counties at the moment. Um, why not set one up, John? The, like the opportunity now is to try and do a deal with the Dublin County Board and say, look, let's do a home and away. Why, why shouldn't we? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I spoke to John Costello outside Crow Park uh, before the All Ireland final. Now, he left before the conversation got any bit tricky, mind you, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind a phone call uh, from the Westmead County Board to sit down and, and have a chat about it. But uh, another thing about it as well, if, if, if there has been a mention of health and safety, etc., etc., sure, the Leinster Council and the GEA have uh, plenty of time between now and the game to, uh, to renovate any part of the Cusick Park that they want to do. Yeah. So, look, all, all joking aside, the game should be in Mullingar for the spectacle, for the competition, for... The GAA to take advantage of the fact that this fixture has popped out as opposed to having it at a neutral venue. We built new pavements, for God's sake, for the flower. Will you bring it to Mullingar? We'll wave the toll bridge on the N4 if that's what they're worried about. <laughs> like, can the toll bridge wave it so we can get all the dubs down for the game? One day, one day only. <laughs> right, John, we let you go. Good luck okay, this weekend. Th take care, John. I hope, you, I hope you. you respect the fact we didn't even ask you to preview the weekend. Yeah, yeah, I do respect that very much. Thank you. <laughs> Keep practicing that song for the fly, John. <laughs> yeah, all right, lads. Thanks very much. Good Take luck, care. John. Take care. So, um, the county final is this weekend. The lads yeah, are Gary in. Castle and Normans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Who's going to win? Well, I'm a Shamrocks man. Uh, I was born and bred Mullingar Shamrocks. Um, See what the ball Gary is. Castle bet uh, Shamrocks in the last round. Um, I'd probably be absolutely... Pulled around town for saying this. I like Lomans to win it. I think Lomans. What Lomans I like is they're they're um, they're a club that have invested a lot into their club. Uh, they've they've Mullingar Shamrocks and Lomans have put a lot of work into it, um, and they've really because it was a period where it kind of got a bit dead, and then it picked up again. I remember playing Lomans and Shamrocks. The town would be closed down. Incredible vibes. I used to love it. Uh, they pretend to hate each other, but they don't really. It's like that kind of you know we have to hate each other. We yeah. don't. We. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see Lomans win. Yeah, OK. Two quick things. Um, the Ulster Senior Football Championship draw for 2020 has been made. The preliminary round is Monaghan Cavan. Um, so that's a, a long route for either of those two to uh, provincial glory, although it has been done, obviously, most recently by um, Donegal, I think. And then the quarterfinals, straight off the bat, Donegal against Tyrone, Derry against Armagh, 
Fermanagh against Down and Antrim against the winners of Monaghan and Cavan. So uh, Donegal Tyrone, obviously the pick of the the games and that, but Monaghan Cavan also is going to be pretty interesting. And I suggest they should all be played in Mullingar. Yeah, that's a good idea, games, yeah. yeah. As like a, a festival of football. Yeah. Not great football, mind you, some of those games, but... Um, Doesn't matter. Come on down. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, I want to ask you, you've got a new podcast up and running at the minute. It's like seven yeah. or eight episodes in. How's it going? Well, it's, it's actually serious. I did it in, ser- in, in kind of se- like each series. It's called Where's My Mind? And it's kind of just more about I suppose it's, it's a, it's a programme to, to kind of help us deal with the absolute chaos of this world. The world's mad. It's moving very fast for everybody. Um, and it, I suppose it's a six-part uh, thing where I kind of use my studies and training to kind of go, how do I figure out ways of giving people some, some tools to navigate the madness? Um, and we're going into live podcast now and Dublin Podcast Festival and Sugar Club in the 80th November, our second series. So a lot of work into it. I love, I love podcasts. I am. I think they're the best medium to really get into people's heads, to really kind of uh, immerse them into something. Is it long form interviews, or is it uh, series, or is it everything? It. I try to bring a totally different hat to the production on the podcast. Uh, I, I'm a big consumer podcast, but I, I kind of felt that for me, the type of stuff I'm trying to get across, the long form interview wouldn't have worked. Uh, interviews definitely are a part of it, but I, I felt more it was more kind of almost educational part, and then each each. Um, each podcast had like a meditation attached to it. Now meditation's got a, a strange kind of connotation around it, but for me it's, it's, I have a totally different approach to it. I think that an awful lot of the overwhelm that people are feeling, including athletes, is, being, is coming from outside external stuff, culture, environment, what we're surrounding ourselves with. And one of the things we say in the podcast, we have an old brain for a new world. It, it, we really haven't been designed for this. Um, it's all moving. So I'm trying to figure out a way, how do we realize that? How do you look at the, the kind of hostile stuff that's so overwhelming you and then the really, the really good stuff that is really good for you that yeah. you kind of keep forgetting about? Um, so for me, the podcast was quite... A, I didn't want to kind of copy anybody on it. That sounds like such a cliche thing to say, but... So, well, it, yeah, people should listen to it. It's, um, it doesn't sound like anything else, which is... I, I yeah, it's quite immersive. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's hopefully uh, incredibly helpful for people, and that's what I wanted it to be. And it's, it's where's my mind. It's on all podcast platforms. Um, and the live podcast is sold out, but we're going to be announcing some very cool things very soon. You can get on the Go Loud app as well. I, yeah, I just absolutely. checked this morning to make sure. Um, the the negativity, right? Mm-hmm. It's so difficult for people to look away from negative stuff. Mm-hmm. It's almost impossible. Yeah. Because it's, it's like a flashing beacon over there going. Do you know why, though? No. We were designed for this. This is the thing people don't tell us. So when we were living in caves, right? I mean, we're getting to evolutionary psychology, but this, I'll be really quick with it. We lived in caves, and humans are really amazing survivors. We've survived all these, ma- all the four point, like, we were, that's where we're born survivors. And the, the reason we're born survivors is because we have, we have a negativity bias. We prefer negative things. It's, that kept us really cautious when we lived in caves, and we thought there was a python behind the bush. We always believed there was one there. And that negativity bias, that's what our brain evolved from. So what's happening now is the reality is that negativity bias is being kind of exploited. So if you watch Netflix, all you're going to see is murdering, drugs, like uh, you watch any headline. I mean, you just have to look at the papers. It's just, it's not because that's the only news there is. It's that's because we love it. Why is every EastEnders episode truly horrifically hard to watch? Because we have a tendency to lean towards negativity, not because we're bad people, because that's how our brains were designed. That's the design we have. It worked really well when we lived in caves because there wasn't a hell of a lot of information to consume. But now it is just coming at a rate of knots. And that's why you find yourself down a 20 long Twitter thread cesspit going, what did I just spend my last? Yeah. So this, that's self-awareness. Becoming aware that that's how your brain was designed from a neuroscience evolutionary point of view. And that's the stuff we get into. You can then choose to go, well, I go down this Twitter cesspit and spend the next two hours of my day feeling a bit crap. Yeah. Um, and that negativity is being exploited and used against us. And there's like companies in America called the Dopamine Labs. That's the name of them. And their job is to design stuff to make you addicted to it. Um, so it, there's very, that's always existed, but never in the history of mankind have we been exposed to so much it's info. Per- it's particularly pronounced at the minute. Yeah. So is that something that you got drawn to because of your own experiences or did you, what was chicken and egg for that? For me it was my own experiences but also it was, um, I, I run a charity, Lust for Life and an awful lot of my work is advocacy and, and working out ways of how we can better explain these things to policy makers and stuff like that. So uh, the one thing that was always thrown at me, sure, sure, what would you know? I said, right, well I'll tell you what, that's a fair point, so I'll go and I'll study. And I went and did my masters and I did 
uh, I, so I went and studied in psychology and into mindfulness-based interventions. And I looked at the areas that I find most potentially helpful for, for the modern world. And I put my head down and studied, and now I'm going to bring that study on. But that's not because I want to keep studying. It's because I want to be able to advocate in a far better, far more kind of holistic approach that it's not just my story. It's like this is the research. This is the academic side of it. This is the professional side of it. Um, and I, I find it deeply interesting. And I also, f I also realize a lot of people, including athletes, now this is the big thing about sport, is we have these perceptions that they're these beacons and pillars of perfection and they're invincible. They're not. They, they deal with immense levels of adversity and injury and they, they, don't, they perhaps don't deal as well as we think they do with it. Um, and that's the big thing with sport. For years, sports psychology wasn't a thing. And uh, sports psychology is, is, is tends to be more based around performance rather than the individual. I'm more interested in the individual. How are they? How are they holding things? How are they dealing with things? Because that then transcends into the squad and to the team. So yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting area, and you know I think it's great we're talking about it. But the, the reality is as well, we're not creating effective systems to deal with it. And um, so that's where my kind of passion lies. And so your aim is to try and influence policymakers to start talking about this, so that it becomes part of. Well, I have no interest in policymakers. I have okay, interest so, in people. Right. So uh, I uh, always believe it. To what end, though? To how, do you, how do you help change the system, I mean? Change the system is the people. Paradigm shift. Um, I always believe that for years I was like, oh, we have to get to the government. We've got to get them to do this. The government won't do anything unless it becomes politically expedient, unless there's actually votes in it. And that's not because they're bad people. It's because at the end of the day, politics is about power. Uh, it's about maintaining and holding power. Um, and the, the thing about it is if we can get people to understand that these are real real things that we can change and be really optimistic about and this week's mental health week or tomorrow's world mental health day the progress we made in ireland is immense it's incredible and we have to note it but the reality is we haven't made progress in our systems and um, we have to look at more effective education systems and that's not the teacher's job we have the resource teachers to do that because they have enough to be at um, so this is a bigger picture and it's a paradigm shift and it's not this isn't about um you know, being intense and heavy. This is just reality. Um, people are overwhelmed and people do struggle. And it's not a, a depressing, dark thing to say. It's just a fact. But the good news is there's things we can do. Uh, and that's what I wanted to go away and kind of grasp. Um, and it will take time. So is the, is the podcast a, um, a, a guide for people who might be feeling overwhelmed to wake them up, to make them mindful about the fact that there's a reason that they're being negatively impacted by the outside world. Absolutely, and it's also the podcast is to tell them this is not your fault. It's not your fault, your brain's only doing its job. And, and there's two levels to this, like there's people who have who've, who had serious issues, who need serious support and serious help, and there's people who are just a bit stressed at work, a bit stressed at home, a bit overwhelmed, aren't quite sure how to keep up with the world. That's all of us, really. Like, all of really? us, literally all of us, because once again, when you break it down, um, I always call it, our brain was designed for life, just not this one. It is too fast, um, and it, you know if you look at all the, the studies and research, and we know that now. Um, so the whole thing about the podcast, first thing I wanted to say to people, first and foremost, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. We're all collectively a little overwhelmed here. So take a bit of solace from that. Secondly, so what can we do about it? What are the, what are the active things we can do? It? You need to become aware of what's doing the overwhelming because because the world's moving so fast, we don't know what it is sometimes. Mm -hmm. And people go, I remember, do you ever go on holiday and? you go, I can't actually relax because we don't know what it feels like uh, because we're never in that mode and then we get paranoid when we do feel relaxed. Um, so there's all these aspects of it and it's not, it's not heavy stuff. It's really, it's really simple Accessible. stuff about aware. being aware. Yeah. Be aware of your, your environment and what it's doing to you. And an awful lot of our environment's deadly and it does great things for us. Surround yourself with sound people who make you feel good. That's a good starting point. So what's next then? The, the podcast will continue a second series of it? Second series. There's a lot of work in it now, to be fair. Um, I put a lot of work into the production, into the writing, into how impactful it can be. So it's a six-part series and now I'm writing the second series. Right. And each, the second series is, is, a, is a progress up. We're looking at things like ecotherapy and nature and how nature actually has an impact on looking at the environment. So we keep talking about climate change, but we're not talking about the psychology of climate change. Why aren't we moving? Why aren't we changing things? Uh, why are policymakers not? So it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite um, in-depth stuff. And we have some incredible people on the next series of, 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 for interviews. And that's the good thing, because the, the first podcast did really, really well. It, it, it gained a little bit of kind of, right, this, this is good, this works. So it's attracted some really interesting people for the second series, which I'm really excited about. And I'm, I'm going to LA in November to do a uh, live podcast in LA on the 8th of November in, for Ireland Week. Right. And that's going to be Great. You know, pretty interesting. Yeah. So with the Americans. But we do all the mad stuff, neuro, like neuroscience. We, we're mapping people's brains. We're showing people how their brain works and stuff like that.
Okay, well, best of luck with it. It's called Where's My Mind? Yeah. Named after the Pixie song? Absolutely named after the Pixie song, in case someone goes to Robin the Pixie. No, no, we, we knew actively that. did that. That's yes. fair enough, yeah. yeah. And it's available on the uh, Go Loud app and wherever else you get your podcast. Uh, no, thanks a million for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me, lads. Loved it. Um, we're going to let you go because we're going to cross back to Japan where Owen Sheehan has sat down with Shane Williams. Have a look at this. All right, I'm delighted to say I'm joined here by Shane Williams in the city of Oita. Shane, you're an expert when it comes to the country of Japan, so uh, you're the person, I presume, giving advice to most people over the last couple of weeks? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm an expert or what, but um, I might be giving advice. I don't know if anyone's taking it, to be honest with <laughs> you. No, look, it's, it's good to be back in Japan. Uh, it's my first time in Oita, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Sun's out. Hopefully it'll be a big game. Yeah, let's hope so. This country is a country that is perfectly equipped to host a Rugby World Cup. I can't get over just how logistically brilliant it is, how brilliant the people have been. And it helps as well that the rugby's been pretty good. Yeah, uh, of course. You know, before coming out, people would ask me, what's it going to be like And in Japan? And I said, look, it's, it's, a, it's a great place. Um, they've never hosted a World Cup before, but I can assure you they'll be organised. They'll make sure everything's OK. Everyone will be looked after. Uh, and it's probably the most courteous, friendliest place in the world. So, you know, when you put that together with the logistics, who, you know, they're very organised as well, so everything's sorted for you to go travel-wise. The trains are efficient, the buses are really good. Um, so it was perfect, you know, and uh, they certainly haven't uh, let us down so far. It does help when the rugby's really good. Mm. It probably does help when the host nation is doing really well <laughs> as well. I don't want to rub it in, but uh, they, they, they're doing okay. Um, but... No, look, it's, it has. It's been such a unique World Cup, such a u- unique experience that it's been a huge success so, so far. What's been the things that have stood out for you from a rugby perspective in terms of moments that we've seen or players that we've seen? Um, I, just, I just think that um, generally the, the, every game I've watched has been great. Um, you know, you don't get your tier one sides just dominating uh, the, the, this World Cup and having all the accolades. You know, teams like Russia have done really well. Uh, teams like Namibia are having a crack. Teams like Uruguay as well, uh, you know, I've, I've been pushing teams and beating the likes of Fiji, um, you know, and, and it's just generally been just a, a, a great World Cup. Different, you know, there's uh, there's been a lot of handling errors. Mm. You know, there, there are there have been issues with, um, you know, the humidity and and the, how slippery the ball is. But that that's just part and parcel of the game, and um, you know that has meant that the game has become more open, I suppose. So it's it's just been fun. Yeah, it's interesting. This is the only question about the weather I will ask you, but you mentioned the humidity there. It's been mentioned quite a lot by the Irish management over the past couple of weeks because of the games in Shizuoka and the game uh, in Kobe as well. There were a lot of errors and they have blamed them quite a lot of the humidity. Does, as a player who's played over here for quite a while, is it a, is it a thing? Is it a real excuse? And how quickly does that not become an excuse over these next couple of weeks? Does it get cold? Does it get less yeah. uh, muggy out here? Oh, look, it, it has been muggy for sure, but it has. You, you can already feel that it's it's cooled down slightly. We have got the sun yeah. on us here, but I've been at games where I'm, you know, I'm throwing clothes off because yeah. it's, you know, my, my clothes are dripping within minutes. Look, it it is. It, it's not an issue because you know, you're going to have World Cups in different parts of the world. Well, you know, might have somewhere cold next time where we're going to have to wear coats and jumpers to play or what. Um, that is that is rugby. You know, it, it's no surprise to me that Japan have probably played best some of the best rugby because they're used to the conditions. They got good handling, um, handling skills. The discipline is good. So they've you know they've prepared the best as, out of any team probably. But it's the same for any other team. You know, you are warned about the conditions before you come out here. You know, it's up to you as a team management to uh, to make sure that you are prepared, that you train in these kind of conditions, and hopefully when you get here. You know, okay, the first game you're a little bit rusty, and we've seen that, especially in some of the first games. But you kind of adapt to it, and you know, two or three games in, you should be really used to the conditions. And you know, on the flip side of it, if you know there are going to be a lot of handling errors, you've got to prepare yourself to counter attack and counter that for the other team as well. So, look, it, it is an excuse. You know, I've I, I played out here, and it, and it has been an issue at times. But I kind of thought straight away, well, I I got to get used to this, and mm. and you kind of have to in a in a World Cup in a short space of time. We have seen some amazing rugby, though, despite the conditions. And from a winger's perspective, I presume the likes of Matsushima and Cheslin Kolbe, um, Bimpi, all, all these lads have, have kind of stood out for you. I, I was going to ask you, if you were to pick a dream back three from Rugby World Cup 2019 performances so far, who would you pick? Yeah, oh, look, you've, you've probably mentioned uh, the majority of the men. Um, Matsushima has been fantastic for, for Japan. Um, you know, he's a, he's a little fella as well, under 80 kilos, but he has a real go. He is quick. 
Uh, he's at the right place at the right time, scores lots of tries, and that's a sign of a good winger. And he's enjoying himself at the mm. moment, which is, is deadly for anyone who plays against Japan because a confident winger, trust me, is a, is a dangerous one. Cheslin Kobe has been one of my favourite players so far. Uh, you know, again, smaller in stature than even myself, I think, and he's very sharp. It's, it's just off the mark. It's just the first 10 metres. That's all you need in, in, in Rugby International. And he's got that he's got a huge right step. He's got a good left step. And um, he's gutsy. He's ballsy. He has a go. And he's very strong as well. You know, when defences think they've got him and they put him down, he kind of just swerves back up and then just glides away. He's been fantastic. Uh, oh God, full backs. I don't look at the full backs. I look at the wingers. Um, oh, no, there's, there, there'd be some fantastic work. Um, full backs. Of course... Uh, Bowden Barrett's been amazing. Sure. Um, you know, talk about conditions. I've e- I think I've even seen Bowden Barrett drop the ball, so they, mu- yeah. they must be quite slippery <laughs> out here. But uh, look, he's he's just been superb. The fact that you know he's he's almost been given a free license at 15 there. Um, you know, obviously the 10 position's covered, and he's been superb. But that, you know, Yamanaka for for Japan has been good as well. Mm. Um, Rob Kearney's playing uh, playing with a bit yeah. of uh, fine form as well, but. I think, you know, I'm just really enjoying the rugby. I'm enjoying the fact that wingers are scoring lots of tries. That yeah. means that the games are open, expansive, and uh, and I'm enjoying that. I hope, I, I, I haven't even mentioned Fiji. Fiji have been superb at times. They've been bloody awful at times as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, Renandra and, and these kind of guy, Tuasova, brilliant to watch. And then, you know, you're, you're watching them through your fingers sometimes as yeah. well. But um, it's been great. The, the back three have been fantastic. The rugby's been great, and I've enjoyed every game. Feel free to go full nerd here when describing a rugby winger. You mentioned Cheson Colby and his ability to step off both feet. Having that ability as a winger, how important is that and how much power does it give you when you go into one-on-one situations? Oh, it gives you all the power in the world unless you're caught by a tight dead with two hands and then you get, you know, you get that taken away from you very quickly. But it doesn't tend to happen to him. It's uh, the fact that he can step off both his feet petrifies defences because they know they can't close him too quickly because he'll step. And um, you know, and sometimes defences will tell you, look, you got to get to him before he starts running. That's easier said than done, especially mm-hmm. with this fella, because he kind of bides his time perfectly, and then bang, he's gone. Um, it makes a hell of a difference. It really does. It usually means that two defenders are going to track you and try and try and cover both your inside and outside, which means there's a space for someone else. And not only that, you know, if if um, if he doesn't, if he hasn't got the room to take you on. You put it past you, and then it's a sprint, and uh, there's not many that's going to catch him. And then you've got my bimpy on the other side, and the other fella as well. So, um, look, plenty of gas, but it makes a difference when you, you've just been held by your jersey, and you've got that power of both feet to kind of just rip away from it, and then just get away. And, and like I said, first 15, 10, 15 metres, Matsushima, uh, Kobe, these guys are electric. You know, they, they're, they're five foot six, five foot seven, 100 metre sprinters, they're probably not going to be up there with you know uh, the likes of the Mabimpies and these guys because they're 100 metres a long way when you've got small legs trust me <laughs> but it's the first 10-15 metres these guys just are gone right okay uh, Wales uh, against Fiji tonight it's an interesting one when you look back through some of the games that you've played in the World Cup against Fiji 2007 a classic I'm sure you wouldn't reflect on it as such four years later I completely forgot about this you come out and beat them 66 nil or something like that uh, when Fiji is mentioned to you in the context of the World Cup do you get a little bit of a shiver down your spine because of 07 uh, yeah 07 stings a bit uh, still does thanks for bringing it up <laughs> uh, no look you know on, on that day we were we, we went against a, a good Fiji side of very experienced some great players thinking that we, whatever rugby we played against them was going to work mm. now, Fiji came out all guns blazing throwing the ball everywhere and we thought okay we can do that we've got you know we've got players in the team that can do that yes you can but you always risk yeah. playing Fiji rugby against Fiji it doesn't work you know offloading and tackle popping up almost playing touch rugby at times um and it backfired. You know, we, we we lost against a better team. We could have won the match. There were instances in the match where we could have won, but that's World Cup for you. You know, yeah, you you do that mistake, and next thing you know, you've you've lost against a team you shouldn't be losing against. And um, it's done because we we literally lost our coach on the day. He was almost sacked on the spot. Mm. Um, and that's never good, you know, losing when you when you're mates. Because you know, Gareth was one of our, one of the lads as well for us. So it does sting. Yeah, you know, four years later, beat them uh, very convincingly. Um, you know, beaten them since, but that's just Fiji for you. I think this Fiji squad now, when I look at them, you know, could it could be a hell of a team. It really could. If you know, if, if there was, the, the coaches had time to manage them completely, mould them into a team, they'd be deadly. Because from backs to forwards and the lads they got on the bench and even involved, a world class are some of the best 
players that are playing the European League. So um, they are difficult. I think what Wales have to do is kind of, you know, uh, numb the pain early on. Stop, stop the legs um, or the backs getting involved in the ball, getting the offloads in. That means you've got to defend them very aggressively, get in the face, and make them make mistakes because they make do make a lot of mistakes. Um, and I don't know, if, you know, if, if you watch the Uruguay game, I have no idea how they lost that match, yeah. but it was all because Uruguay were fantastic. They had a real go, but they made so many mistakes. They just you know shot themselves in the foot really. So there are plenty, plenty of ways to counter Fiji. It's just. Don't go out there tonight, guys, and play touch rugby against these boys because they would kick your ass. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. From a Welsh perspective, where does this team rank in terms of the great 2011 team? Because I presume 2011, when you look at the World Cup squads, was the best one. Or am I getting kind of bogged down on where they actually finished when you compare 03 to 07 yeah. to 11? Oh, no, look, for me, um, the, the squad I was involved in from 08 uh, through to that World Cup um, was the best squad I'd been involved in, certainly. Um, Obviously, we we done pretty well. Should have done better, um, but that's that's uh, again the past now. I think for me that you know the, that was without doubt the strongest squad I was involved in. But back in 2011, you look at the you look at the games we played. A lot of a lot of the first team played a lot of rugby because we probably didn't have the strength and depth that this Wales squad have at the moment. Um, you know, we have a luxury now that we have an abundance of back rowers scrum halves, wingers, a couple of good full backs there as well, centres that, you know, if, if one of our main lads goes down, and I don't want to jinx it, you know, we've got someone to come in and, and fit in very comfortably and not look out of place and, you know, be just as good as, as, as what we have already. So, for me, without doubt, this is the strongest Welsh squad I've seen. Um, I think it's stronger than, it, than we had in 2011. But, you know, back in 11, Warren Gatland was building this squad, sure. probably for you know, 2015 and 2019, whatever year it is. And I, I think he's, he's done that well. You know, he's lost a couple of players along the way. Sam retired in last year, Talupe Falatau. You know, but we still got some great uh, back rowers. James Davis is playing against Fiji and, you know, he'll want to go out and prove his worth. So that's great. That's where we are at the moment. We have that strength and depth. And um, it's squad, it is a squad that wins you World Cups. So, uh, you know, I'm quietly confident about that. It's interesting when you look at the context of, of Ireland and what you're, you're talking about there. 2011 is obviously something that gives us as Irish sports fans nightmares, uh, that game against yourselves. Like, you talk about perhaps wanting to achieve more in your time, whereas much, many Irish rugby supporters would be like, just give us one semi-final and we would take it. But very quickly, I'd imagine that changes, that any team who goes out to actually just win a quarter final it's actually kind of a defeatist attitude because it's gone within a week. Suddenly, getting reaching a final then becomes the holy grail. Yeah, look, you, you get no prizes for a quarter final, mm. unfortunately, or a semi final. Um, yeah, look, I think for me personally, and, and most of the lads I played in 2011, we had a lot of self belief. We had a lot of lads that were talking about winning the World Cup in mm. Poland in pre season training, yeah, pre World Cup training, I should say. Um, and that kind of became infectious very quickly. We believed, we did believe we could win the World Cup. When we got to the quarterfinal, we we almost, you know, we were so confident we were going to beat you guys that we just went out there and played with a bit of arrogance and, and you know, a couple of great performances in, in, in individuals. But as a team, we just felt we were going to get to that semi-final. Um, and when we got to the semis, again, we just felt so confident we were going to beat France. And obviously circumstances changed, mm. but we still felt with 14 men we were the better team. And then France go and do what they do in the World Cup and nearly become world champions. Um, look, the, these these things still do kind of uh, pop up once in a while where I, I wake up at night thinking, oh, I nearly got to World Cup final eh? and we could have won it, you know. So, you know, for me, when it, if I'd have won it in 2011, at the end, I wouldn't have been that shocked. I, I, I honestly believed that we were going to win that World Cup. So that does that does sting. Look, for you, for you Irish boys, you went to a, you know, we pray at a World Cup, best in the world and rightly so. Um, tough team to beat, but World Cup is is just a little bit magical in that sense. You have you have your upsets, you have your shocks. I was there for that Japan Island game, and it's probably one of the most unique experiences I've ever mm. experienced in a in a stadium. Absolutely crazy for for the the neutral fan. What a game, you know. And uh, you know, the, myself and probably sixty thousand, however many were there, didn't think that Japan were capable of doing something like that. But that's the, that's the you know that's the glory of the World Cup, I suppose. Um, it wasn't that Ireland were particularly poor on the day; didn't play their best, sure. But you know Japan were just superb. Mm. 
and and these things happen and they've happened to me and they've happened to uh, you know uh, World Cup winning teams as well but I think that's why we enjoy the World Cup it's you never know what's going to happen Uruguay against Fiji Uruguay should never have beaten Fiji yeah you know Fiji were exceptional against Australia lost the match yes but they were great and then you know you have Fiji by 50 60 points against Uruguay and, and they lose the match mm. and yeah it's just magical yeah um, I'm just going to come back to 2011 there because you mentioned something there which is interesting. You say that you played with uh, an arrogance that was necessary in, in that uh, quarter final in 2011, which is funny because a lot of people say Ireland were too arrogant or too confident going into that quarter final because they'd done the hard job, they'd beaten the Aussies yeah. uh, down in the Southern Hemisphere. Ah, look, I don't think you can ever be too confident. Um, yeah, no, really, you know, there, there is a, sometimes you can be too arrogant for sure, but. I don't, I don't think Ireland um, were overconfident. I think you know they knew they had a very good team. On paper, you know they it, it was very even. I think between the both sides, and and of course they're more than capable of, of beating Wales with the squad and the team they had. Uh, we knew that, but we just our, our approach going into the game was well, was to, we're just not going to you know we're not going to be all like come on let's do, give it our best and see what happens. Mm. We were going in saying right, we're going to dominate the back row. We're going to keep ball. We're going to do this and that. And we'll beat this team. We'll beat Ireland, and that's that's all it was really. And and we went in and and did that. We played played with that confidence. We played with that attitude. And from the first minute to the 80th minute, we really believed we weren't going to lose that game. And sometimes that's all you need. It seemed that dominating that back row was the absolute key. That once that was taken away from Ireland, Declan Kidney did not know what to do. No, look, the, the fact of the matter is Ireland have always been strong in the back row. They are now. And you look at the players that haven't made, made the squad through injury or whatever reason. Uh, and you've got the likes of O'Brien and these guys that you know are, are physically powerful, physically strong. If you lose that breakdown, you lose the match. And we had, you know, obviously players like Sam and, and Lydia who just went and took a bit of hell for leather into them. And, you know, it was an arm wrestle from first minute to the last. And, you know, fortunately for us, our boys came up on top. But our, our back row was fantastic the, the whole World Cup. So, again, that was an area where Warren Gatler would tell the boys, look, you know, they've got a good back row, O'Brien. But, you know, Tulupe, are you, are you better than O'Brien? You know, Lydia, are you going to let these lads run all over the top of you? And it was almost a challenge that was set early on. Magic of Gatland, though, isn't it? It is, and he, you know he knows what he's doing, and he knows as well. Sometimes the Welsh, you know, don't don't fully believe in the, in in their ability. Sometimes we're a we're a try hard nation, where uh, or a hard lines nation, and where where you know, oh, you did really well, hard lines, but sorry, you're up the quarterfinals of the World Cup. So he he knew it was an 80 minutes where we just had to uh, stand up, and it was all about the back row and the breakdown, and uh, you know, it, it was a war. Yeah. It sounds very like the current Irish mindset, the sort of quarterfinal team. Like Rob Penny, I was speaking to him last week, and he says that sometimes we have that small man, man mentality in Ireland, whereby like, we, we kind of look at, at the outside as a, as a challenge all the time, but sometimes can get bogged down in moral victories a little bit too much. Does that ring a bell to Wales pre-Gatland? Yeah, I, uh, oh, without doubt. You know, I've been, I've been involved in this Welsh squad. <laughs> the music's come on now. <laughs> I've been involved in this Welsh squad for a very, very long time, and um, you know when I got in the team, uh, team initially in 2000, it was a very, very good team, some world-class players. But I, I always had the kind of feeling that, you know, we'd, we'd go out away from home against England, and it'll be like, come boys, just, just do your best today and right. see what happens, rather than the mindset now is, you know. Warren Gatlin was close to Twickenham and he's telling the lads look we're favourites for this and we're going to win this one and if we win this match we're going to win the Grand Slam yeah. and all of a sudden you know if you'd have told me that in 2000 when I first got in the team or 2003 when Hanson was there I'd have been like oh okay I don't know about that Sure. but you know uh, it'd be nice if we, were, if we were but I'm not sure I'm not 100% confident but since Gatlin took over he just he just used to tell the lads look you, you can be the best team in the world yeah he tell me, look, Shane, you're, 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 you're playing the best rugby at the moment. You're one of the best wingers in the world. All of a sudden, I was six foot five, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and I was going into these games thinking, um, you know, I, I was a world beater and anything can happen. And he, he kind of installs that into his players, not only for Wales, but you, you probably ask the Lions boys that he does it, he does it for the Lions tours as well. And um, sometimes that's all you need is just a bit of confidence, um, you know, a, a can-do attitude, I suppose. And, you know, you go out there and you do the business because it's a fine line international. It's only a millimetre probably from the, the best player in the world to the fifth or sixth best player in the world. And it's the same with the team. So you just got to get it right on the day. The last uh, kind of World Cup memory I want to touch on is not from 07 or from 11. It's actually from 2003 because it's something that we don't hear you talk about too often. The journey that you went on within a World Cup. Yeah. Uh, so for people who may not realise, uh, what position and what rank were you when you started the tournament? Uh, and where did you finish <laughs> up? 
Oh God, I have no idea where we were. We were on the bottom somewhere. Um, yeah, we, we'd had a poor 2007, really. Um, oh, sorry, 2003 we're 2003, talking about. Sorry, I'm, I'm talking about your own personal yeah. position. Oh, yes. Third choice scrum half. Oh, for me personally, mm. God, yeah. Right down the peck in order. <laughs> uh, third choice scrum half. I wasn't even a scrum half, so that says it all. <laughs> I think I was just a token gesture of... Um, of someone who, who who could fill a gap really, uh, could play in a couple of positions. I wasn't a scrum half as long as I had a hole in my head. Um, but I made the tour and I didn't care. And um, for me personally, it was the turning point in my career. Mm. I, I, you know, I, I had my first cap in 2000. I spent 18 months out of the team, and then had to fight my way back in. And you know, it might have been by default, but you know, I was the third choice scrum half going to a World Cup, um, and I was going to do my damn most to, to get in that team really. And, it was frustrating because I, I didn't play in, um, I didn't play in in many of the pool uh, st- uh, games at all. Actually, I was on the bench once, didn't get on, um, and then we played All Blacks in the final match. And um, through injuries and a few wanting to rest a few players, we'd already qualified for the uh, quarters. Really, um, I was asked to play against the All Blacks, and um, without doubt, the turning point in my career. I told myself before the game, look, Shane, if you don't play well today. Don't expect to play for Wales again. This is your chance to prove a few people wrong. Wow. Against the All Blacks, no pressure. Against the All Blacks, but I, you know, me and a lot of other lads up there as well, probably, you know, weren't sure if they were going to play much rugby after that. You know, like Tom Shanklin, Jonathan Thomas, and these guys. We just went out there and, and you know, did our best and give it our all. We, we at, at times we were fantastic. At times, you know, we left in soft tries and, you know, again probably up there with one of the best rugby matches in World Cup history. And we lost the game, yes, but. You know, I, I come away, I'd scored a try, got involved in, in a couple of others. Um, you know, and even though we'd lost the game, I had a, you know, a cheeky little smile on my face because I thought, well, you know, if he doesn't pick you again after this, then, you know, there wasn't much more you could have done on the field. And, you know, I played the following week against England in the quarters. Um, again, another game, perhaps we, we, we were good enough to win. Yeah. Um, and I came back relatively happy because... You know, it was it was a huge personal journey for me because I wanted to get back in that team. Yeah, I was just about to say, actually, I remember watching that England game. That's, like, just from memory, it kind of feels like a game that was nip and tuck, that the world champions were there for the taking that day. Oh, without doubt. You know, we first half, we were by far the best team. We, we God, we run them ragged. We really did. Uh, we scored, Steve scored a crack and try. Uh, you know, we dropped the ball over the line. We, you know, we did a lot that day to win that match. Um, and I think it was the kicking game in the end from Cat and and John, uh, Johnny Wilk, Jonathan Johnny Wilkinson that uh, changed it. And you know, we ended up losing to the to the team that eventually won it. So again, for us another another one that got away. But you know it, it was a great weekend. You know again I played pretty well that day. Set up Steve for a try. Uh, set up uh, Nugget for a try as well. And you know even though it, you know it, it's always hurts when you lose and you're out of a World Cup. I kind of I kind of walked away from that game thinking well. You know, you've done all right, Shane. You've done okay. Um, hopefully, now this is the turning point in your career, and and it was. And you know, I didn't get dropped from the team after that, and that wasn't because you know, I I, I was the best thing since sliced bread. It's because I bloody worked hard. Mm. I didn't want to be. I didn't want that feeling of not being in the team again, being dropped, not being good enough. And it kind of it, it did. It made, eventually made me the player I was. So I'm not going to ask you who's going to win the World Cup. But we're going to go through the permutations here. It looks like Wales have every chance of topping this pool, every chance of beating France in a World Cup quarter-final mm. against one of the big two then in a semi-final. Do, do they stand a chance? Do you think that, that Wales can make a World Cup final? Oh, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I, um, look, let's, let me get Fiji out the way first. <laughs> um, look, I, I do believe Wales are good enough to get to the final. Um, you know, there are going to be a lot of big games along the way. Obviously, uh, if it's if it's France in the quarters, that'd be great because you know we've got some unfinished business. Yeah, boys can do for 2011 for me. <laughs> um, and then you you get honestly, you, you, quarterfinals almost the hardest one sometimes because. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, you, you honestly you, you're a little bit nervous. You know, you can kind of see the semi and the World Cup around the corner. Uh, it's always a tough game anyway, the quarters, and. You know, you you fail at the quarters sometimes. You feel you feel like it's a it's a bigger been a, a failure of a World Cup, mm. I suppose. There's a lot of pressure on you, but if you get past that, honestly, it's you know I think anything can happen. Any team can beat any team. We've seen France in the past uh, beat the likes of uh, the All Blacks, and you know, and then go on and have a absolutely poor game after it or rubbish game. About 2000 was it 2011? The France lose to Tonga in the pool stages and and play some awful rugby and get to the World Cup final and should have won it. Mm. So that's that's the glory of 
of the World Cup, really. But uh, I do, I, I honestly do believe Wales can get to the final and win the World Cup. Uh, they're going to have to work hard. It gets harder from now on in. But you know, I think it, there's uh, about five or six teams that can that could potentially win it. You know, it does. Really, it's it's all about getting through the pool stages. Sometimes it doesn't even matter if you're first or second when you when you look at the draw in sense. But uh, what you what you've got to realise is that you need to start playing well in the knockout stages, and that's the quarters and, and obviously that, so on. So um, yeah, I think we're a confident bunch. Speaking Ireland win day before yesterday, and uh, you know even he was smiling. So there, there must be something good going on in the <laughs> camp. So uh, yeah, if I see that, that's a lucky sign for me. <laughs> Uh, Shane, I'd say we were about to get uh, sunburned here. We should lash on the factor 50. We were in the shade when it started. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about you. You'll be, you'll be all right. Like, you'll be all right. <laughs> Thanks a million for being so generous no with your time. Cheers, Appreciate thanks. it. Thank you, buddy. Uh, welcome back to the Pat Kenny Show here on News Talk. Uh, how did we come up with that name for the show? Says you. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, a good one there by me. Well, usually in times of turmoil and political instability, it's nice to have the uplifting world of sport to turn to, unless, of course, you happen to be an Ireland rugger fan or a Man U footy fan. Guilty on both counts, Your Honour. Uh, as you know, I'm a massive United fan. Of, uh, I've been to many big games there. I, I still get goosebumps uh, when I recall sitting in the stands at Old Tafford, uh, singing with the United faithful uh, in unison, uh, uh, Kino, Kino, uh, Kino, uh, just like that. And uh, when I met Roy recently, I was telling him of that uh, very happy memory, and he just looked at me, or or, or through me, perhaps is is more accurate. He said nothing, and then just walked away. Uh, yes, I could tell how moved he was by the retelling of that particular tale, and. Yes, that's Roy for you, uh, a, a gas ticket. Um, anyway, uh, the big question for the Rugger fraternity is what's happened to the Ireland team in Japan? I'm delighted to have with me on the phone, uh, live from Japan, uh, the man himself, Joe Schmidt. Um, uh, how are you, Joe? Yeah, hello, Patrick. Yeah. Um, how are preparations going? I presume you're right in the midst of dealing with the preparations for the clash with the mighty Samoans. Yeah. 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 The, the players had a, had a last weekend off. and yes. uh, But I've been studying footage of Samoan defensive lines all yes. third and fourth phase. But uh, I, I'm just about to get stuck into a tape of Samoan breakdown clear out since uh, 2011, which I'm, I'm also... Uh, pretty excited about. Yes, yes, I can imagine. Uh, Ireland seem to be struggling with the humidity more than most. It, isn't it the same for everyone, the Joe? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, to be honest. Uh, uh, we've actually taken a measurement of uh, the internal temperature of every member of our squad, uh, well, the ones that aren't injured, uh, and on average, they're naturally yes. uh, 7.6 degrees warmer than our opponents. So, uh, Tyke Furlong is actually 32.7 degrees hotter by nature, which is why most of the time he has a head like a, a boiled ham. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, of course, the rules of rugger are complex, aren't they? Very complex. In fact, they're so complex that they're not called rules at all. They're called laws, uh, which is pretty confusing, even for someone with a degree in engineering uh, like me. Um, but how will you cope with the Samoans? How will you uh, differ your your game from what's gone before. Uh, what about picking Johnny Sexton? That might be an idea because he's pretty good, you know, Joe. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, Although I suppose injury would be a concern with Johnny, wouldn't it? What happens if some uh, massive Samoan with an apostrophe in the middle of his name and a tattoo where the sun don't shine uh, juggernauts his way through Johnny and slap bang wham, he gets injured? What happens then, Joe? No yeah, Johnny? Yeah. Again, that, that that's not really in our control. So uh, I suppose you could start uh, you could start Carberry, couldn't you? Leaving Johnny on the bench, and then when Carberry gets injured, which shouldn't take too long, you could bring uh, Johnny on, put him at full back, uh, avoiding that sort of mad contact, and putting Rob Carney or Jordan Larmer at out half. What about that, Joe? Yeah, yeah, that, that wouldn't really make much sense. Um, I, I, I did a bit of uh, coaching myself, uh, Dorky under eights, and we tried to play a more expansive game, certainly than Ireland are playing at the moment. And I thought, what about bringing Simon Zebo out, Joe? Have you thought of Simon Zebo? Oh, for f sake. 
like. Or maybe not, maybe not. Uh, finally, Joe, some controversy about whether the game is going to be played or not because of a typhoon. Uh, how will you prepare for that, Joe? Part of our process is, is not to concern ourselves with things outside of our control. So what tangible benefit is there in worrying about uh, typhoons? Yes, tangible benefits indeed. Good point, Joe. Uh, finally, uh, Joe, you picked Jack McCarthy, didn't you, to start against uh, Japan. Uh, was that a mistake, Joe? A bad mistake? Do you regret that one, Joe? Yeah. Uh, Pat, Johnny was actually carrying a knock that week and... Uh, made that pretty clear that we tend to try and avoid picking players who are in fact injured mm. which is why we picked mm. Jack Carty what a f***ing moron yes thanks Joe thanks for that well no wonder things are going pear shaped for Joe not waiting to listen to common sense right we'll take a break Richard's Rugger thing on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. All thriller, no filler. All killer, no filler. Excellent stuff from Rich from start to finish so far. Well done. Phil, how are you? Good, yeah. Been enjoying Rich Tard, yeah. All of it. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah. <laughs> 9 31 this morning, we're a bit late. Phil, how are you doing? Good, yeah. So Watching the Scotland game, they already have their bonus point wrapped up against Russia at the Rugby World Cup. They lead 35 nil in Pool A. So, had the bonus point wrapped up by the fourth minute of the second half when George Horn scored his second try and Adam Hastings got two in the first half. So, Scotland need two bonus point wins. So, they have that one. Yeah. They need to beat Japan with a bonus point, which would bring them to 15 points. Yeah. Ireland beat Samoa on Saturday, but if they don't get the bonus point, then we would be on 15. If Scotland were to beat Japan with a bonus point, but then Scotland got a losing bonus point... Oh, another try. We'd all be on 15 points. This is getting a little bit hairy for us now, because I, I didn't think it was going to be hairy, but it is getting a bit hairy, because yeah. the points difference coming into this game, Ireland were uh, plus 52, Scotland were plus 10. Scotland just scored 40 points, so our plus 52... They're about to go level with us now once they, they get this conversion. Exactly. So suddenly, um, now there'll be a point behind us on the table. Yeah. But that's all. Yeah, which means we'll have to... Like, if we beat Samoa with a bonus point, we're all right. But if we don't, then... So say we beat Samoa but don't get a bonus point, which is very possible. Yeah, the way we've been playing, you... Then we'll all end up on the same amount of points if Scotland beat Japan. With a bonus point. Yeah. Don't want to confuse people too much, but if we all ended up on 15 points, which, forget about how it can all get there. Pretty easy. What happens is the team with the best points difference goes through. And then the teams in second and third, that goes down to your head to head. So if Japan get knocked out of top spot and are in second place, we're in serious trouble. If Scotland beat Japan, say, 28-22 with four tries, yeah. close game, but they score their four tries, or whatever it is, and say it's a rip-roaring encounter, which is actually in both teams' interests yeah. to be, not, not to be one of those kind of tight, forward-driven things, which Scotland have no chance of winning anyway. So Scotland open up the game, they win by a last gasp try uh, they don't even need to convert it 28-22 it's a close game then that's their four four tries bonus yeah. point they're suddenly on uh, 15 points and we are um, down to points difference yeah and we're going home just message for Joe Schmidt and Saturday lads go out there and we get the bonus get points. the bonus point so we can watch that game feet up relaxed yeah cheering on exactly because the they play on the Sunday look we haven't even mentioned the typhoon <laughs> that, that could also play Tommy shouted in my ear saying we're, we're gone we're gone we're gone but are we gone um, okay, he says do your bulletin first. Okay, well look, I'll just tell you, the Ulster draw, Donegal will start the defence of their Ulster title against Tyrone next summer. That's one of the three quarterfinals confirmed already. The other ones are Derry against Armagh and Fermanagh against Down. Then Monaghan and Cavan will meet for the right to play Antrim in the quarters. Just to mention earlier on at the Rugby World Cup, Argentina beat the USA 47-17. Wales and Fiji kick off at 10.45. Two wins from two for the Republic of Ireland in Group I of the Euro 2021 qualifiers. 
That is after last night's 3-2 win over Ukraine. Ireland away to Germany, or, or away to Greece next month. They have Germany in the group. Germany are walking away with that. And uh, just one last bit. Irish boxer Amy Broadhurst, just one win away from a medal at the Women's World Elite Championships in Siberia. She won her last 16 bout. She's into the quarterfinals. She'll take on Finland's number one seed, a name you will recognise, Mira Pakkanen, the woman that beat Katie Taylor at the Rio Olympics. She's already beaten Broadhurst earlier this year. She beat Kelly Harrington last year. She just goes around beating Irish boxers. So hopefully Broadhurst can settle that tomorrow. And Christina Desmond, the Cork welterweight, in last 16 action after 12 today. Um, Owen, Owen was at uh, one of the onsens, the hot springs in, um, in Beppu, I think he is, today, this morning. And um, apparently he wore his trunks, which is culturally insensitive, I'm told. You're not, you're not supposed to. It's like, so there you go. He was too coy to strip off with how it was reported. Uh, there's another drive for Scotland. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. They're racking up the points. Uh, so that's uh, 42, 47 with uh, conversion to come. They're going to TMO it, I think. But anyway, uh, Johnny Kennedy, good morning to you. Uh, says Owen is the new Carl Pilkington. <laughs> Which is about right. Um, Sean Paul Griffiths in touch says, I spent three weeks in Japan. I just got back today. I don't think the humidity was that bad. But then again, I live in Latin America for the last 15 years. A long way from Bridge End, South Wales. Uh, good man, Sean Paul. Thanks for tuning in. And AB said they had to send Owen to Japan in the hope that he might unclench after the dubs did five in a row. I think he's uh, finally unclenched. Um, and Colin Mem says, Brezzy should be on every morning. Talks so much sense. Top bloke. Check out his podcast. You can get it on the Go Loud app, as indeed you can. OTB Sports Radio, your uh, 24-hour sports radio station from off the ball. And how happy does Owen look to be with Shane? I thought Shane Williams was pretty happy. He found the only man smaller than him in Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, two uh, impressive athletes. That's it from us this morning on OTB AM. Shade from Phil Egan uh, about, uh, about our own, but uh, he'll answer it tomorrow. In case you missed anything from the show today, we had Noah Breslin, Ruth Fahey, John Heslin and Shane Williams. You can catch the podcast back off the ball.com forward slash podcasts or on the Go Loud app. Check out our YouTube channel and subscribe there. Tonight on Off The Ball Live from 7 o'clock, Wednesday Night Rugby from 8 and the football show from 9. We'll see you tomorrow morning on OTB AM at 7.30. Kieran McGee going to be in studio and we'll bring you breaking news of the Irish 15 to face Samoa as it's announced in Japan. Good luck. OTB AM